Back to John. Hey, Phil, can we do a quick sound check? Make sure we can hear you. Mr. Reidinger, can we do a quick sound check? He's showing up on the list, but he's not showing up with a microphone or a camera. There he is. Hey, Phil, Mr. Reidinger, can we just do a quick sound check? I'm here. Great. Thank you. All right. Good evening, everybody. Um, I'd like to call to order the October 27th, 2021 Electronic Hybrid School Board Work Session. Ms. Cadell, can you call the roll? Yes. Dr. Anderson? Here. Dr. Dimmick? Here. Ms. Downs? Here. Mr. Henderson? Here. Ms. Litton? Here. Mr. Reitinger? Here. And Dr. Ruiz Bolanos? Here. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ms. Cadell. Um, can I have everybody join me for the Pledge of Allegiance? I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you, everyone. Um, we now need a motion to adopt the agenda. Go ahead, Dr. Anderson. Chair Linton, I move that the school board adopt the agenda as presented. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Is there a second? Second. Thank you, Dr. Ruiz Bolanos, um, Ms. Goodell. Yes, Dr. Anderson. Yes. Dr. Dimmick. Yes. Ms. Downs. Yes. Mr. Henderson. Yes. Ms. Litton. Yes. Mr. Reitinger. 
Yes. And Dr. Ruiz Bolanos. Yes. Thank you. Great. Thank you, Ms. Goodell. All right. With that, we will move into the work session part of our agenda. And the first person we have on the agenda is our vision session with Ed Elements. I see that they are here joining us. So thank you guys for joining us tonight. Um, and I believe they're going to be giving us kind of an overview of the outreach they've done and then do a session with the board. But I will turn it over to Dr. Noonan if he wants to give any additional introduction. I, I think you pretty much covered it, but thank okay. you, Chair Litton, and good evening, everybody. Um, it's nice to see everyone both virtually and in person. Um, it's uh, our pleasure this evening to welcome the Ed Elements team. Um, and the person that we've been, um, who's been leading this amazing group uh, has been Natalie Woods. Um, and Natalie is gonna lead the conversation tonight, but as uh, Chair Litton indicated, um, it will begin with some introductory remarks, a little bit about kind of where we are. Um, but then um, the, the plan this evening is to lead you all in sort of an engagement session that isn't um, a focus group necessarily, but more of a visioning statement, a visioning session around um, what, where do you wanna see the school division go over the next couple of years? Um, all of this is a consequence of the work that we've been working with other elements on around the strategic planning process. Um, and, and tonight she's gonna to share some, the team is gonna share some information about how many people we've had outreach with, um, but it's really been impressive. Um, I was just sitting here before the meeting talking with um, Ms. Minson and Ms. Michael, who both were part of a, a session this afternoon with the middle school students. Um, and our middle school students were just absolutely amazing as they were doing their focus group, saying things um, for students who haven't been in our system the whole time, um, saying things like, this is the most inclusive school system I've ever been in in my life, saying things that our, our teachers are caring uh, more than any other school system. So we're getting some really wonderful feedback and also getting some good feedback about direction um, and thoughts about our work as well. So. Um, we've had some really good, good strategic planning um, focus group sessions, but tonight it's really about you as a board um, and having an opportunity to meet with Ed Elements and talk a little bit about what your hopes, desires, and dreams are uh, for the future of the City of Falls Church Schools. So with that, um, Natalie, I'm going to turn it over to you um, and, and we will sit back and watch the magic happen. Great. Thank you all. We are excited to be here tonight. We'll start off with some brief introductions. And like Dr. Noonan said, we will walk through, give you some updates on the progress that we have made so far, and then just have a, a really strong, rich conversation tonight of the visioning of where you where you see Falls Church going. So I will introduce myself briefly. Um, I am Natalie Woods. I am based out of St. Louis, Missouri. A year ago, for the past 10 years, I lived in DC, so was not far from you all, but moved home to be closer to family. A couple of my teammates that are not here tonight, Porby and Tim have been, um, Porby is part of the project team and she is on a flight tonight and is unable to join us. Um, and Tim has been helping us with all the focus groups. Like Dr. Noonan mentioned, we've been leading and facilitating quite a few focus groups and he has been helping us behind the scenes. I'll turn it over to my other teammates in a moment. Um, my background, I started in high school, uh, high school business education, and have had the opportunity to work with Education Elements for six years. I have been lucky enough to work alongside Falls Church, got to know them through the Northern Virginia Collaborative, have worked with quite a few districts, neighboring districts around you all, um, and am the project lead on this strategic planning process. So really excited to get to know more of you tonight and be able to engage with you. I'm going to turn it over to Drea, who will introduce herself briefly, and then to Katie. Hi hey everyone, thank you so much for having me. Andrea Getchus or Drea here. Um, I am super excited to be here with you. I am originally from the Springfield area, so right by you all, that's where my parents are. Um, and like Natalie, I've been with the organization for about five and a half years now. Prior to that, I was a special education teacher in Arizona. Um, and I do a lot of the work around strategy and thinking about how to best engage our stakeholders. So uh, incredibly excited to be a part of this group today. I know that already a lot of great work has done, has been done in Falls Church. So thanks so much for having me and I'll pass it over to Katie. Great, thank you, Drea. Uh, good evening, everyone. I am Zooming in from Reston, Virginia, so very close to you all. Um, really, my, my work at Education Elements and really over the past 10 years has been centered around helping 
uh, school districts really optimize their school culture and climate. Um, similar to both Drea and Natalie, I got my start in education as a classroom teacher. I taught elementary school in Atlanta, Georgia, uh, first and third grade, and then uh, went, went back to school and concentrated my area of research in children's mental health. Um, so very, very excited to be here with you all and share a little bit about the process and also hear from you all about uh, what is in the, the future for Falls Church. Um, so we've, you've had a chance to hear from us and wanted just to take a couple minutes if Education Elements is a new name for you all and just tell you a little bit more kind of broadly about the, the work that we do here at EE. Um, so our belief or our mantra is that schools grow when people grow. And so how we support growth looks a little bit different depending on the need of the school district. And so sometimes that's in the form of helping school districts implement um, a new large scale initiative such as personalized learning. Sometimes it takes the shape of supporting them with crafting their vision for the next three to five years in a strategic plan. Um, it can also look like thinking through best practices around teacher retention and recruitment. Um, so regardless of kind of what the, the work looks like, what is held constant across all of the different projects that we support with is really our methodology, which is centered around um, design thinking and responsive practices. And at the heart of what we do, um, we really make sure to stay true to that methodology across all of our work. Um, so Natalie, I'll hand it back over to you just to kind of talk a little bit more about the timeline for this work. Thanks, Katie. And I know that uh, in your last school board meeting, Chair Litton gave a nice overview of some of the work to date. So just wanted to bring you back to this timeline. We kicked off this work in August, which seems like a while ago. Um, really since that time, we've been working with the project team in what we call our plan and align phase. During plan and align, we are learning as much as we can about the district. We are trying to understand the plans that you have in place the vision of the leadership team, we are starting to identify what stakeholders can we bring in and when, and we're starting to really lay out our timeline of this work. We were able to kick off with the steering team in October. Um, so earlier this month, we were able to kick off with that team and we will be in person with the project team and steering team in the middle of November. What's going on right now are a, a variety of stakeholder engagement events. So I'll talk more about what those stakeholder engagement events have been so far, some numbers, some facts, so you have some ideas of how many people we've been in, able to engage with. But just looking forward a little bit further, we will have a couple other in-person design sessions. We'll continue to meet with the team to revisit the plan once we have that plan in place, to prioritize, to communicate, to think through what is this going to look like when it's in place. How are we going to monitor? And then how do we bring this to our schools and to our community to bring this to life? The plan is that this will come out in March, so this spring, um, and we are just in the beginning development phases of having conversations with stakeholders to hear from the Falls Church community what is so important for your schools. So one thing before I talk about some of the stakeholder engagement events that we've had this, uh, these past couple of weeks already is there will be additional ways for stakeholders to engage later on. So those in-person design sessions in December, we will see additional stakeholders that join us there. There could be community planning nights, there could be working groups to design these plans and actions. As we get further along and have plans to review, we wanna make sure that we bring it back to stakeholders to say, this is what we heard. Does this align with what you were sharing? Does this align with the future, the vision that you want to see happen? And once those plans are ready to go, we're going to need stakeholders to help to carry out those plans. So there will be lots of continued ways to engage with stakeholders. So speaking of stakeholders, let's give a little update as to what has been going on. So we have had 12 focus groups. Um, those will wrap up next Monday. And you can see a glimpse here of some of the different focus groups that have taken place. So there have been teachers, there have been students that we've been involved with. There's operations employees, some parents and guardians and community members. Tomorrow night, there's a parent guardian community member a focus group happening in Spanish, which is really exciting and, and is, is going to be outside and with chart paper, which will be awesome as well. Um, we will have um, focus groups, there have been some, like Dr. Noonan was sharing earlier, some that happened earlier today with students, and we will have um, our final focus group next week with school administrators. 
The community assessment opened on October 18th and will close this Friday. As of 1.30 this afternoon, there were 325 responses, which is great. And we have a town hall this Thursday at 7 p.m., which will be held virtually. Also, as of earlier this afternoon, 62 people have signed up and there is still spaces and we'd love to have more people sign up. And we will talk, we'll share um, a bitly at the end of this and that will um, be a great way to get people to sign up as well. When we're looking at tonight, so as we're talking about stakeholders, um, what do we see tonight as? So we see tonight as an opportunity to confirm what we're hearing across a variety of those stakeholder groups and also as a visioning activity that can help us to inform the plans that the project team and the steering team and the planning and advisory teams will put in place. So speaking of tonight, let's talk a little bit more about what tonight will look like. So we're going to ask some questions and we're looking to hear a variety of responses from you all. We wanna hear how can we strengthen our support for Falls Church. We wanna hear about the community. What is the community saying? What are perspectives that you've heard? What are hopes and aspirations that you have as school board members for Falls Church? What are hopes and aspirations that you've heard from community members? How this will go, so we'll begin with Chair Litton, who will recognize the next speaker. And what we will do is we'll ask questions related to these four domains that you see on the bottom of the screen here. So we'll ask questions related to academics and instruction, climate and culture, organizational resources, and community engagement. Similar to all of our stakeholder engagement events that have happened thus far, we have asked questions related to these areas. The community assessment was based on these four organizational domains here. Our town hall will be focused on these four domains. Our focus groups have been centered around these four domains. Now, depending on the different focus groups, so for teachers, we focused a little more on academics and instruction and climate and culture. Whereas when we had the operation staff, we focused a little bit more on organizational resources. So you can see that there's times that we are, are spending more time in different areas. We're gonna cover all four of those tonight. So we will ask a question, either Katie, Drea, or myself will ask a question. We'll then begin with Chair Litton, who will help to recognize the next speaker. You all are welcome and invited and encouraged to respond to each question, but you don't have to. If others before you have shared what you had, would have already shared and you feel like it's been captured, you don't have to add to it, but you're welcome to. Just so you know, Katie, Drea, and I, we will do our best to not respond, which is always hard in a conversation, but we are here to facilitate and capture as much as we are hearing. We may ask for clarity or a bit more information. Um, and we may just make sure that we hear from all voices, but other than that, we are here to facilitate, to capture questions, and to hear from you. So we're going to start with a check-in question, which is something that we do at the beginning of all of our meetings, whether it's internal or external. It allows us to hear a bit more about you, how you're coming into today's session, and just gives us an, a gentle practice question. So Chair Litton, I'm going to start with you. The check-in question is here. So you get to select an image on this page that represents how you're coming into tonight's session. And you can take that in whichever way you want. You can respond with, maybe you felt a little rush coming into this. Maybe you've had a very light and airy day. Totally up to you how you respond. But if you could let us know which image represents how you're coming into tonight's session and anything that you wanna share about that. And also one word to describe Falls Church. And then from there, I'll let you call on the next person. Oh, wow, you're putting me on the spot. <laughs> Which of these? Um, wow, there's something about the umbrellas that just is striking me. I don't know because it's such a blustery day. It's kind of feeling like there's umbrellas or things flying. Maybe that's how my life feels right now too. Lots of different things flying around. Um, so, so I'm going to pick that picture. Um, and one word to describe Falls Church um, community, I think is the word I would use. And with that, I will pass it down the line to <laughs> Vice Chair Downs. Thank you, uh, Chair Litton. Um, I don't know, I guess I would, I would say, I would say the fireworks, I guess, because this is, um, as a school board member, um, sort of halfway through my term, this is something that I've never been engaged in is a, is a um, strategic planning session. So I think it's really exciting and to see 
all the members of our um, various uh, constituents in our school community involved. It's, it's really exciting. And I think I would say the word I would, I actually thought of community too, Terlitt, and um, I guess the next word I would use would be engaged. I think we have a very engaged community. Thanks. And Dr. Anderson. The advantage of going third is I've had a chance to think a little bit about this. I'm going to go with the cat because I'll just tell you, my cat um, wishes he was that cool, but I don't think I could get Luna to wear glasses. That wouldn't work. Um, and I didn't pick the lake because I actually know exactly where that is. And that seems like cheating. So we'll move on. If I were going to pick one word, um, I would go with dynamic because there's a lot going on right now in town on multiple levels and not not the least of which is the wind that's coming uh, coming at us right now so and I will look next to me too, Dr. Dimmick. Well, I'll pick the lake. I don't know where it is. Is it Tahoe? Okay. It seems like an alpine lake. Um, well, um, Ms. Downs took my word. I was going to say engaged. Um, Committed, concerned. So we heard committed and concerned. We'll capture both of those. Not sure if it has been passed to the next person yet. Yes, it is Mr. Henderson. Um, I'm going to say I like the picture with the balloon, the hot air balloon. And um, I'm going to say that uh, the word that comes to mind is uh, intellectual a lot of uh, people with advanced degrees in this community think that um, a school system reflects a community that appreciates the IB system. It's a little hard to hear you, but I believe you said the word was intellectual. That's Is that correct? correct? That's correct. Great, thank you so much. And why don't we go ahead and turn it over to Mr. Reidinger. Thank you, Chair. <clears throat> I, uh, I think I'm gonna decline to pick a picture because it doesn't really, it's not a process that works for me. So I'm just gonna skip it. Um, and instead say, you know, I do think the strategic planning process is critical. Um, I'm actually not going to pick a word to describe Falls Church, but a word to describe the strategic planning process, which I think is pivotal. Um, I've been involved in a number of these processes, and I'm, you know, I'm doing one now in my non-school board life. Um, and it, it seems to me that uh, the importance of strategic planning is that you have a common sense of mission and vision and a way to describe it that unites all of the efforts. And I, I can't say how important to, I view the effort, um, but with that, I'll just stop. Thank you. Dr. Ruiz Bolanos, do you wanna go ahead? Thank you, Chair Linton. Um, my initial one was the cat, but then somebody took the cat and they've all been taken off lemon. No, but um, I will go with the balloons as well, actually. Um, and the word that I use to describe that has not been used, because I would have already used probably some of the other words that were used, um, is actually two words. If, Sue, if Dr. Dimmick can put two, I'm going to put two that are actually opposites, uh, global and small. So at the same time, just a very um, international community with a lot of uh, diversity. And then at the same time, it's a very small community. All right, I think we got everybody. 
All right, thank you. Thank you, Chair Litton, for facilitating that. And thank you all for taking a moment to check in. Let us know how you're coming into tonight's session in one word to describe. We know it's very hard to summarize false church in one word, especially when other people have gone before you. So we appreciate you taking a moment to do that with us. So we are going to move into our first question and I'm going to turn it over to Katie. Perfect, thank you, Natalie. And so how this will work as Natalie kind of introduced it before is that we'll uh, rotate asking or posing these questions to the group and Chair Lynn, I'll defer to you as far as the order in which um, folks respond. And as Natalie shared, um, feel free to share your thoughts um, or, or, or not if, if um, you feel that your thoughts have already been captured or you uh, don't feel inclined to, to share. And so this first question here that you all see and that we're curious to get uh, your thoughts on both as a member of the school board, but also in uh, what you've heard around the community is um, understanding what you see as the biggest indicators of success for students and staff in FCCPS. Uh, these might be the same indicators across both groups or they could be different uh, depending on if uh, you're speaking to students or staff. So Chair Litton, I'll, I'll turn it over to you to uh, go ahead and um, ask the, the group in the best way to respond. Great, thank you. Um, why don't we go ahead and start with Dr. Ruiz Bolano since she had to go last first time around. Maybe we'll go in the opposite direction. Um, so any thoughts you have on this, Sonia? Yes, um, thank you, Chair Litton. So I guess, some of the biggest indicators of success for students um, in academics and instruction for me would be seeing um, those among us that have the least resources. So the ESOL and the free and reduced school lunch program students faring and reaching heights and paths that were unreachable, unreachable before. Um, and for staff, for me, it would be to see, um, you know, staff retention and I guess, and growth. I think that's like thriving staff um, where you see everybody, like, and I guess this kind of goes into climate and culture as well, but that kind of happy community where it's a trans parent and um, collaborative community where kind of a teamwork is there. I don't know how long to make my answer, so I will stop there. Thank you. Thanks, Thanks Sonia. Uh, Mr. Reininger, would you like to go next? Sure. Thank you, Chair And So <clears throat> I think this is a, a, a difficult question to answer because it actually says not metrics, but sort of indicators. Um, so it's not the areas of growth, it's what you actually measure. And I, I certainly don't know that we've cracked that nut yet. Um, I can tell you that I think for both students and staff that we want to measure success in a very personalized way. Um, you know, the easiest way to put it for me for students is that, you know, every student grows as much as that student is capable of that we maximize the student's potential. Um, whether that's, um, you know, going to Harvard or a you know, super well-rated college or doing something in art or music or, um, you know, going into a trade or profession where that person is particularly happy. You know, I, I, I think it's a very, it's a very personalized question. Um, and I think it's really tough to measure if, how well you're doing at that. Um, you know, we've talked about this a whole bunch and, you know, <clears throat> there are certainly things that are valuable, you know, SOL scores are something useful when they show growth. Number of people who go to college is something or graduate on time is useful, but number of people who go to college is not particularly useful because some people really shouldn't go to college and we shouldn't, st we shouldn't steer those people to college. So I I'm very much struggling and have been for my entire term on the board in terms of what the indicator um, of success should be in that space. Um, staff, I think I can answer in a shorter period of time because it's really the same. You know, I, I think we want staff 
to maximize their potential. Um, and that inherently benefits the mission of SCCPS and our students. You know, we want our teachers, our bus drivers, our cafeteria workers, um, our administrators, everybody to grow as much as possible to love what they're doing and get as good as they can be at their job because that benefits everybody. Um, so I, I, I think that's that may be a bit of a punt on an answer, but it's to me, it's more sort of a process question um, and a how you look at it question than a, you know, we look at X, Y, and Z. Thank you, Mr. Reitinger. Um, Mr. Henderson, would you like to go next? I think uh, Phil basically covered everything. Uh, he was so broad on everything that he touched on. But um, I would think that a well-rounded education, one that is respectful of multiple perspectives with a world view would uh, be a success in my, in, in my view. Uh, Dr. Dennis. Thank you. Um, yes, I guess I'd agree with Phil as well. Um, I think it is really challenging to measure. I mean, I want to see our students be independent and adaptable, and I want them to be critical thinkers. I want them to experience deeper learning in the classroom, but unless we find a way to measure things, then it's hard to, you know, we measure the SOLs, but I if our end goal is just improvement on the SOLs, I think we've lost a lot. So how do we come up with measures that will allow us to, to, to see that student growth and to see the growth of our teachers? Um, yeah, I think that's a challenge. I also think that many families move here for the great school system. So I think there is also a tension between needing to, needing to be a, good school system that people move here for um, and yet not focusing on teaching the test in order to achieve the scores that show that we are a top school system. So I think that's attention. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. And before we go to you, Dr. Anderson, Ariana, we'd love to hear from you if you have any thoughts on this. Um, I would agree with everyone. And I know there's high school student focus groups, and I'm sure they'll say similar things, but I think community engagement is a particularly important and having a variety of students engaging in a variety of activities in the classroom, of course, is important, but also outside of the classroom in sports and various clubs. So I think a lot of times there can be a pretty stark distinction between who is coming after school and kind of forming those connections and those deeper, that deeper learning through student-based activities and student-led activities and who isn't, aren't in those clubs, aren't in those teams. So I think having a more um, equitable and equal amount of people engaged in all types of activities in the classroom and outside of it is a big indicator of success. Great, thanks, Ariana. Uh, Dr. Anderson. Thank you, Sherlyn. So I'll join the chorus who says, uh, says that Mr. Reitinger summed a lot of what I was thinking. Ariana also just hit upon another thing I was thinking about too, because one thing that we haven't talked about that's I think an indicator of success for both is um, that our students and our staff not only are achieving to their highest potential, but they're willing to try growing in new ways. I don't know how we quantify that, but you know, students who are, who are stepping outside their comfort zone to try something new or willing to stand up for something that they believe in that may not be, there may well be an argument the other direction, right? And, and having that sort of debate, I think is a, a, a good indicator of success for students and for staff, for staff to be able to, to um, go out and show their creativity and how they do their particular role, um, I think is important. One other thing that's a smaller indicator, so I'm, I'm subverting the request of biggest indicator to give you a smaller one, um, but a smaller indicator, but one I think is worth paying attention to is um, we have a number of staff over the years who have left for various reasons and have come back. Knowing that we're having people who could go to any number of divisions around, they're coming here is, a, I think, for us a, a bit of success. And also, um, 
it, I don't know how we track this, but um, you know, word of mouth. If if people who are coming to uh, Falls Church to be a staff member in our school are coming because they were told by friends or connections that they have here, hey, this is a good place to work. That would be a measure of success. I'm unable to hear. Yeah, I'm not sure as if someone is speaking. If... Can can other people hear? All of a sudden, we can't hear what's going on in the room. It was a very very faint voice, but so can the mic... you hear me? Yes, we can hear you, Doctor okay. and Shannon. Do you want to get closer to your mic, maybe? I'll try a new mic. Can you all hear me now? Yes. Okay. That's much better. Thank you. <laughs> this is like one of those cell commercials. What you things. said was amazing. Can you just say it all again? <laughs> We're all wrapped up. We're all done with the strategic planning. I solved it all. Um, no, I was just going to say that I think, um, you know, we want our students to be successful in how, whatever path they choose, right? Whether it's be community college, a four-year institution, a trade school, going right into the workforce. Um, so that's, you know, that's in, hard to measure. I, I guess one thing, I guess we, we could always look at graduation rates. Um, no matter what, I think we want all of our students to be graduating. Um, but in terms of staff agreeing with um, Dr. Ruiz Bolanos, really looking at um, just satisfaction, job satisfaction, and I think the best, the quickest way or easiest way to uh, determine that is just retention. You know, are we keeping our, you know, staff that are happy and feel a part of this, um, that they believe in Falls Church City Public Schools and that they're paid well and that they have um, professional development opportunities and um, they're engaged and feel like they have they have a part of this um, they're they have a part of this big plan. I think that is going to um, having teachers the retention excuse me the retention rate having a high retention rate I think is a good indicator that our teachers are satisfied. Thank you. Thanks, Laura. And like everybody, I'm going to say I think you guys really covered most of what I'd want to say. I think my only big picture thought is that. You know, I think we want students who are healthy and happy and are able to go on into their life being healthy, happy people. And I think we want staff who are healthy and happy. And I know those aren't really indicators that are measurable, but I think, you know, as a community, we're often pretty, pretty focused and intense. And I just don't want us to leave behind the like, you know, we want kids to have some joy in going to school and we want teachers to enjoy working here. Um, so yeah, so that's my two cents. All right, and I think that's all of us. So um, I'll turn it back to you guys. Great, I'll take the next one. Um, so next question is when FCCPS says IB for all, what does that mean to you? So Chair Litton, I'll let you uh, take it away from here. All right, let's see. Um, why don't we start in the middle this time with um, Dr. Dimmick? Thank you. Um, to me, it means that IB is infused with all elements of what we do um, that are not just our students, but our staff are inquiring and caring and are lifelong learners. Um, I, to me, it also, it is sort of what pulls us away from teaching to the test because of the depth that IB provides um, and encourages. Um, having a global mindset, project-based learning, all of those things to me are IB for all. Great, thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Uh, Ariana, do you have some thoughts on this, the IB for all? Um, I wasn't thinking of one, but oh, sorry. <laughs> it's okay. Um, but I would say, I think 
not sure exactly what the division is doing in regards to IB for all, but I think having um, a variety of students engaging in IB learning um, is incredibly important. And it being in IB classes or like Dr. Dimmick said, being having that IB access in all types of education, not just the higher level IB classes in high school. So. Great, thank you. Uh, Mr. Henderson, you wanna go next? Yeah. Well, uh, to me, IB for all means that uh, we, uh, we have a district, an educational, we have a school system here that um, is on the cutting edge of, of uh, an advanced curriculum, which many colleges look at when they um, look for students. But also, and this is what I've always felt, that many people can send their kids to school to school here in this district. Um, and it's like going to a private school um, in a public setting and using public dollars. And um, that's what I've always felt when I uh, raised my kids here. And I think that uh, that's what it means. Great, thank you, Mr. Henderson. Um, Mr. Reidinger. Thank you, Chair Lytton. I <clears throat> I don't have much to add to what Dr. Demick said. Um, IB for all means, as she said, that we use an IB based approach to learning for everybody. So, you know, if you're, if you're going to a trade school, um, you're ready when you go to your trade school to creatively solve problems in mechanics or plumbing or whatever you're doing that you're a, you know, you've used project based learning and you've you you've built those creative problem solving skills that will let you succeed in what gives you passion in life and it doesn't matter whether you want an IB diploma you're going to a trade school you're going to a community college you're going to a four year institution or any of those sorts of things that um, we treat all people the same in that regard thank you mr redinger uh, dr ruiz balanos i think just a, I think a lot of it has already been said. Um, and I do think Ariana hit the nail on the head for me, which is the access to it, the access to that quality of education. So um, it is a rigorous program, but being able to, for all students to be able to access it and also um, the support, right, for the students, for the staff and for the teachers as they create their curriculum and make sure that it's you know, it's supported and they have a support to make it as best as they can. Thank you. Um, Dr. Anderson. Thank you, Chair Lytton. Um, so I'll agree with everything that Dr. Dimmick said, and I wanna build on the thing that, our, uh, that Ms. Amida and, and Dr. Ruiz Bolanos just said and sort of broaden it. The other thing that IB for all is for me is making sure that all of our students have equity of access to the same quality of the education. And, you know, the outcomes, if the outcomes are dependent on, on our ability to foster everybody's individual capacity to grow, but that they all have the ec an equitable access to this high quality of an education is for me, one of the key things about the for all, we really do mean all. Great, thank you, Dr. Anderson, uh, Vice Chair Downs. Thank you, Trill. And yeah, I think um, as Dr. Anderson said, when you say for all, and you know, thinking about um, sort of the continuum from from kindergarten all the way through high school and the elementary level having it be really infused um, throughout the day in different ways, um, all the different learner profiles, and so that happens frequently, many times a day at the elementary level, and then looking at the secondary level in terms of, you know, students at the high school can take an IB class here and there, or they can go for the full diploma. So I, so everyone has access to that IB curriculum. 
things such as the exhibition, which our fifth graders do, and also the personal project, which our 10th graders do. So it's just really infused, I think, from K all the way through 12. And so, um, and, you know, especially as, as students enter the secondary level, they can sort of choose how, how um, I guess, how, how do they want to really go for that IB diploma, which is a little bit more uh, comprehensive, or, or I would say it's a, it's a much uh, bigger um, commitment, or do they want to just be exposed to IB through individual classes? And so it's really a lot of opportunities for all, all of our students. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Downs. Um, again, when I go last, pretty much everybody's already said everything. Um, but when I think of IB, I think of it being not what you learn, but how you learn. And I think it's just that we want that way of learning. We want every kid to have those skills to, to know how to learn. Um, so no one's left out of that. It's every single kid should have those skills. Could I add something? Sure, Mr. Henderson, go ahead. I believe that IB for all means that uh, we hold our students to high standards here in this district. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. Great, all thank right. you for adding that. All right, we're gonna move on to our next question. So you'll notice we're still in academics and instruction, starting to get a little bit into climate and culture here. Mr. Redinger hit the nail on the head earlier with the first question, noticing there was a word indicator and that we didn't mention measuring. We are, now we're going to talk about measuring. So now we're, we're really looking at what does success look like for students in Falls Church? So a few additional details that might be helpful when you're sharing, you could share, how are we measuring? How are we assessing our goals? How are we measuring and, and, and assessing our activities or our actions? And how are we assessing and measuring our IB program standards of practice? I will turn it over to Chair Litton to help facilitate. Great, thanks. It's a little bit to think of, but I will go ahead and turn it to Vice Chair Downs. <laughs> Oh, thank you, Sherilyn. Um, well, I would, it's sort of, this was interesting to me because um, we just recently had a school board session on SOL test scores. And um, it was interesting because um, this board, uh, I guess back in the spring, had encouraged Dr. and his staff to also look past SOL scores and also look at other ways that students are involved. And this sort of um, jumps a little bit on what Ms. Hamid had said. And also, I know Dr. Ruiz Bolanos would agree with me in terms of our ESOL community. So really, um, in terms of, I'm talking mostly about students right now and measuring how um, involved they are in, in our sort of our extracurriculars. I think you, you hit the nail on the head, Ms. Hamid, and trying to um, really measure that, I think is challenging. And, and Dr. Noon, his staff did a nice job, um, as I said, at the past school board session, really trying to look at numbers and, and really whittling that down, how many were involved in the science fair, how many did this, how many did that. And I know our ESOL um, community, we really need to drill down on that as well as how many students are we getting involved in, in these different activities. So um, that's probably not sort of a convoluted answer, but I, I would say that um, really you do, when, when it's sort of students getting involved in activities, it's such an indicator of how, um, how good they feel about their high school experience. And the more that they can do with athletics or extracurriculars, you know, clubs and organizations and band, and they're gonna feel much more engaged and um, they're gonna be happier students, but trying to measure that is the challenge. And so I think that um, Dr. Noonan and his staff are definitely on the right track with that. Thank you. Thank you, Vice Chair Downs. Uh, Dr. Anderson. Thank you, Chair Litton. Um, I would have zeroed into that exact same meeting, Vice Chair Downs, so um, <laughs> thank you for doing that. I, I, I would say one of the things that for me comes out of that meeting and the discussion that we had there, we're talking about how to look at success on a more broadly than just standardized tests and, and looking at the scores from that, but looking at the other sorts of activities. I think one of the things that we need to do through this strategic planning process is, is narrow down the number of things that we're trying to use as measures of success. Not all of these things can be done quantitatively, I don't think. I think a lot of things need to be able to be done 
a little bit qualitatively, but if we try to measure too many things, we're, we're just gonna lose the effectiveness. And so for me, I don't know that I have a straight answer right now of, you know, these would be my top five things. But if we go through this process and we come out the other end with a set of three to six, I'm putting random numbers out there that are sort of the scale of what I'm talking about, ways of measuring the success. I think that's more effective than coming out of it and saying, you know, here are 20 different ways we could be doing it. Um, I think it's just sort of narrowing it down like that. Um, I'm going to, there's something that attached to this question that's attached to the next question, and I will hold it for that one, but otherwise I would keep going, but I'll stop now. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Um, Dr. Dimmick. Thank you. Well, conveniently, I've been thinking about assessment on and off since our last meeting, and I'm going to uh, go in a different direction. I agree that it's important to sort of measure students' engagement with non-core instructional activities, be it um, after-school activities or music, art, band. But I, I also think it, it is our job to make sure that students are growing in their, in their core subjects. And I would like to find other ways of measuring that than the SOL test. I would like to be able to, I would like to know that our students are growing. I would like to know that our students have a sense of well-being, that they're thoughtful, that they're happy. Um, I, you know, measuring just sort of participation in extracurriculars gives us some, um, but I'm wondering what else we can measure. So, for example, in the in the assessment presentation, we had SAT scores. Well, you can study for the SAT, and the SAT maybe you self-select to do the SAT. Well, my ninth grader just did the PSAT. You don't study for it. I think most of the ninth graders, I would assume most parents were like, oh, they're doing the PSAT now in ninth grade. Well, maybe that's a nice measure because we don't teach to it and they don't study for it. Um, how can we better use our STAR data to, to map students' growth? If SOLs can't be compared sort of year to year because they don't show growth, maybe the new ones will, then what does our STAR data tell us? Um, and then I, I actually would like to know a bit more about what's going on in the classroom. If we're gonna measure um, children's sort of uh, achievement and success, what is happening in that classroom? I like, if you look at Bloom's taxonomy, are we reaching the higher levels of Bloom's taxonomy where our students are creating and evaluating and, and being able to really not just apply what they've learned, but really become sort of creators and generate knowledge on it, be it generating a hypothesis, um, be it um, designing something, be it um, creating a piece of art, but that we sort of have a way to measure what's going on. And I don't know that we are actually, I don't know how we measure IB. I don't know that we're actually measuring how well we do with that, other than we, we have the project-based learning in fifth grade and 10th grade, we have the advanced classes, um, but we measure diplomas, but that then again measures the students who self-select into those diplomas. It's not measuring how we're doing with providing IB for all in our district. So, Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Mr. Henderson. Well, being the um, most junior member of the school board, um, I really don't know a lot about the IB program standards of practice. However, um, in years previous, uh, the George Mason, now Meridian High School, was selected by Newsweek Magazine as the number one high school in the country. Now their metrics for um, determining that were based on the percentage, the highest percentage of students that participated in advanced courses and extracurricular activities. And so I think that that is a measure that I will hold up as, uh, as the standard. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. Um, Ms. Hamid. Um, 
I think if you, I'll pass on this question because I just don't know as much of what the board is doing to assess. No problem, thank you. Um, Dr. Ruiz Bolanos. Thank you, Chairman. Um, I think a lot of, a lot has already been said. Um, I think for, you know, and Ed, Ed Elements will begin to understand that I am, I, I do focus and I wanna see the, the ESOL, right? A community and the, the free and reduced school lunch, like that dual um, classified population and, and understanding how we can measure and it might be some quantitative and some qualitative to understand more of how is their access. So when we talk, when, you know, some of the, what has been talked right now about participation in different programs. So what are the limitations? So we'll have a number, right? Did they, were they able to participate or not? And then what were the impediments or why not? Was it because it's a financial cost? Is it uh, the fact that just educationally they're, they are unable to participate because they don't meet certain requirements. So getting a little bit more of that qualitative background to those quantitative numbers, um, I think is very important. Um, and that is just, I think that's what I would add to what has already been discussed. Thank you. Thank you, um, Mr. Reidinger. Thank you, Chair. Uh, as I think I indicated in my answer to the first question, I don't really know the answer to this question in terms of what we ought to be measuring. Um, I know I don't care very much for SOL results because I think we've got a group of students for the most part that come in and, you know, if we let them read a book on their own for a while, most of them would pass the SOL tests um, because they're, they've are they got very supportive families, they're prepared, they're educated before. Um, I will say a few things, um, but what I'm mostly looking for good ideas, I think, from this process and the ed elements. One, I care a lot about graduation rates and on-time graduation rates. Um, that's just a baseline, right? You know, if you have, if, if you're not somewhere like above 90%, then something's gone wrong, right? So it doesn't, it doesn't say you're excelling, but it's super important to me that it be a goal of ours that we graduate every student on time if we can. And if we don't, then it's perhaps been a failure on our part to meet that student where she or he is and to bring them along. Second, to go along with what Dr. Ruiz Bolano said, I do care a little bit about SOL results for um, specific populations, particularly specific populations that don't do as well um, on tests. I don't care as much about absolute rates, but I wanna see the degree of progress in those populations at least as great, at least as great as the general population. Because I, I think it's, it's absolutely critical that if we are measuring SOL results, that we, we care a lot about what those um, unique populations are. Um, the last thing I'd say is, <clears throat> I don't really have an answer for this, is you know, it would be awfully nice to be able to measure our success for students a year or two after they graduate from high school. Um, so as the rest of the board knows, I've got three kids, all of whom graduated last year. So I see how they're doing um, compared to their peers in college. Um, and I'm pretty impressed with how FCCPS prepared them. Um, but really, you know, a, a much broader statistical sample of students would tell us a lot. You know, if, if students, no matter what they do, whether it's a trade school or a community college or a four-year program are finding success, um, at a higher rate than their peers, then it says that they're, they're well prepared to go into that. And my, my prejudice is that the IB program and project-based learning and personalized learning and all the things that we do, do a very good job of preparing people to succeed in the more independent settings that many of them go into when they leave high school. But I'd love to be able to statistically measure that. Thank you, Mr. Reidinger. Um, 
I guess the only thought I would add, because I think people have mostly covered it, and I do think our last meeting, we talked quite a bit about multiple ways we can measure students and could look at measuring. Um, but I think I would again mention, I think we just need to be careful that we don't have lots of indicators that are kind of like the indicators you have to have for a college application. You know, you do a lot of activities and you have high grades because, you know, I think there could be a student who comes from a family that needs extra financial support and they have to get a job and you know they're they're not doing any of those extra things but still in their world they're they're doing well and being successful so I mean I don't have an answer for how we measure those kind of things I just want to make sure we don't forget some of those other populations as we think about this all right any other thoughts on this this question before we move on. All right, I will turn it back to you guys. Thank you, Chair Litton and board. So we know this is a difficult question. We appreciate you all talking about both qualitative and quantitative ways to measure. We're now going to move into climate and culture. So I'm gonna turn it over to Katie for this next question. Perfect, thanks, Natalie. Um, so when thinking about the social and emotional and mental health needs of students and staff, what are some of the most important needs or concerns that you have noticed? And Chair Litton, back over to you. All right, thank you. Um, Mr. Henderson, I don't believe we've started with you yet. Do you wanna take a first crack at this one? You put me on the spot here. <laughs> um, Well, I really don't have a good answer to that because I haven't uh, spent much thought about this going to it. But um, I think it's important. It's, it's a little hard to hear. It, I think it's important. Can you hear me? Can you hear me now? That's perfect. Thank you. Can you hear me now? Okay. I think it's important that we create a nurturing environment um one that is uh, that takes seriously anything that threatens to create a hostile environment for our students um i think uh, sexual and racial harassment are something that we need to look at and create policies for with disciplinary action for those that are the culprits. And um, that is something that I feel strongly about. Thank you. Great, thank you, Mr. Henderson. Um, Dr. Dimmick, do you wanna go next? Sure, thank you. Um, well, I think we're doing this strategic plan at kind of an interesting time because we're in the middle of COVID. So it, it just seems right now that the social, emotional, and mental health needs of our students and, and our staff are, and our parent community um, are, are higher than perhaps in normal times. Um, I guess if I were to answer this question prior to the pandemic, I would say that, you know, there are increasing levels of of anxiety among students and, and what can we do to address that? But I think that's only one piece of it now. Um, I am concerned um, sort of with news of not just our community, but sort of nationwide of, of teacher burnout and the need to you know, help our staff who've had a really challenging stretch. And, and um, I, I do think that at least from what I'm hearing in the community, parents and kids are thrilled that kids are back in school and kids are so excited to be back in school. Even if it is not quite normal, it feels so much more normal than last year. Um, so I'm not, yeah, I'm not sure what to do to sort of improve it more. We are, it, this is a challenging time. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Um, Dr. Anderson. 
Thank you, Chair Litton. Um, I feel like I could spend a long time talking about this one, but I will try to limit myself. One of the things I think about with this one is trying to break it into shorter and longer term type answers. Um, in the short term or shorter term, I think if I were trying to find a sentence that summarized everything going on, I would just say everyone is exhausted and yet we're all still pushing through it. And there are limits to how long we can keep pushing through being exhausted and, and burnt out. Um, so one of the concerns I've heard a lot about from people in the community, one of the concerns that I have is um, really sort of collective community exhaustion and burnout. <laughs> I don't know how else to put it. I don't know what we do um, other than try the best we can to reestablish what a new normal looks like that it is as supportive as we can make it for our staff, for our students, for our parents, for the rest of the community. We have you know, responsibilities that we need to meet in educating the students and in taking good care of our students and our staff and our families. But also um, we need to be careful that we're not pushing so hard that we risk um, just tripping over the fact that everybody's so exhausted. In the longer term, um, I worry a lot about our communities, what I perceive to be a community-wide focus on competitiveness and pressure to succeed, for pressure to keep growing. There's always more, you've got to keep climbing. That's not sustainable um, on a personal level. It's not sustainable on a societal level. There are limits beyond which growth just can't happen. Um, if that weren't the case, the carrying capacity of the planet would be infinite and it's not. So I worry a lot about that. We want people to strive for the best success that they can have. We want people to achieve as much of the success as we can have. But one of the things I'd like us to be pushing for is for all of us to have the level of joy and happiness that we can have too. And in some ways to me, success is only one part of having that. Um, it's the pursuit of happiness, not the pursuit of success um, in the language, I think. And so I'm sort of concerned about how we balance these things, right? We have a mission to educate, educate the students and help them be as successful as they can be, but we also need to keep everybody's um, social and mental health in mind as well. And Dr. Dimmick started to talk about <laughs> pre-COVID, back in the before days, we were really starting to worry a lot about anxiety depression, other forms of, of um, mental health concerns in our students. And I think that's a reflection of that sort of longer term environment. And so as we go back to that, I think we should pay a lot of attention to that. So I don't know, I, I feel like I could keep rambling about this one for a while, but I'll stop. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Um, Ms. Hameed, I don't know if you have anything you wanna add on this one. Um, I would just say I would echo everything everything that's been said, and especially Mr. Henderson, that having an inclusive um, environment that is inclusive to people of all ethnicities and religions is extremely important. And I think generally, which isn't really answering the question, but having it being very clear and transparent as to what um, our city or the board and administration in schools are doing to address these things, what we are doing, I guess is the discussion we're having right now. But once we get there, making sure students especially are aware of what is happening, because I think a lot of frustration um, comes from students just sort of being left in the dark. And I think a lot of communication being geared towards the community and not necessarily students specifically about the processes being done. Great, thank you. Um, Vice Chair Downs. Thank you, Chair Litton. Uh, I think, you know, when, when we look at concerns of, of students, I think, um, as many have said this evening about concerns about the stress level that our students have for a variety of reasons, it could be, um, as Chair Litton, as you said, maybe it's someone who's working a part-time job, um, a student who's working a part-time job and trying to carry a heavy course load. Uh, it could be those students who are overextended with athletics and doing the IB diploma. There's all sorts of different reasons. It could be 
um, their parents lost their job during COVID. So just the stress that our students are, are um, experiencing and even now more so than ever during this pandemic. Uh, my concerns for the staff is um, similar, but you know we think about the stress they have in, in the workplace, um, just trying to do best, do the best they can for their students. Also, they have their own families that they're concerned about. And um, as some may remember, the school board recently sent out a letter to our community um, because some of our uh, staff have experienced um, uh, community members reaching out and not always being very cordial. And I think that's also because our community members are, are in stressful situations and a lot of people are at their breaking points. And so then it sort of gets put back on our teachers and staff to have to deal, uh, have to work with the community members who are not um, being constructive and so, and sometimes abusive. So that's very stressful for our staff. Um, and you know, when, when you talk about needs, I think, for the students, the great, the biggest need is that they have someone that they know they can go to, and and whether that is um, a counselor or it's the PE teacher or it's the um, secretary in the the front office, um, you know, whoever it is, but they feel that they have a, a trusted adult that they can turn to for help. I was really gratified. I know later in this meeting we're going to talk about. Um, perhaps having some funding for some more school psychologists. Um, so I think that will shoring that up is gonna help a lot. So that's really, I think what our students need. Uh, and our staff, again, they need, um, I feel that they need to feel that they have a way to communicate um, to their supervisors and their colleagues in a productive manner so that they feel supported. So I think there's, it's a lot of the same themes for both groups, um, but I do feel that some of the things we were already that traditionally high schoolers and teachers were already dealing with pr before the pandemic, it's just all magnified and amplified now. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Downs. Um, and I would just reflect kind of what everybody else has said, but I, but I think I think this is one of our most significant challenges, and I think it was here before the pandemic. Um, so I think if we look at even pre-pandemic um, kind of issues, what I heard more from parents was like, we're killing our kids. We're like, go, go, go. Um, you know, either, either you're doing that or you have a kid who's not on that track and they feel left behind, like they're, they're not good enough because they're not on that track. So yeah, I don't know what we do on this one, but I think it's significant. Um, Let's see, Mr. Reininger. Thanks, Chair Litton. No, <clears throat> I really have nothing new to add here, I think. The, my main concerns fall into the two subjects that have already been extensively addressed. Um, stress, you know, everybody is pretty much at the end of their rope now. And I think the stress is affecting everyone. Um, and it was, it was a challenge here before the pandemic, as, as uh, board members have said. And the second is inclusiveness. Um, that we really need that a lack of inclusiveness causes stress across the community and it particularly adversely affects um, subgroups of students. And we just, we, we, we can't have that. Um, and so those are the two almost sort of exclusive things that I would note. Um, I did want to flag one quick thing, though, um, which is there's a little bit of an inherent tension between uh, some of the desire to reduce stress and sort of Dr. Anderson's comments about happiness and what um, uh, Mr. Henderson said before about having high expectations for students and high standards. Um, I don't want to trap anybody at Falls Church uh, in Falls Church City Public Schools with sort of, you know, a prison of low expectations. Um, but at the same time, you know, that's very individualized what a person can achieve and it's gotta be balanced against stress and um, a whole bunch of other things that are concerned with the human. So I don't really have an answer with that, but I don't, you know, I don't think we can veer either far in the, everyone must go to Harvard realm or everyone must just be happy. Um, there's a there's a balance there that's got to be achieved between expecting the best from everybody, 
but giving them the caring and the support that they can actually do to achieve their best, um, no matter what that is. And, and, and maybe their best is very, very different from how I or Dr. Noonan or the rest of the board would define it. Thank you, Mr. Reitinger. Uh, Dr. Ruiz Bolanos. I agree. I mean, there's not much more I can add to what has been already said. I think that's uh, Vice Chair Downs, Mr. Reitinger, um, everyone's kind of touched on different points, both for the students and the staff. I think just reiterating, I think for both students and staff, giving them a way to voice their concerns and being able to see that transparency of feedback loop of how things are resolved one way or another, or how to get support. Um, I think that goes a long way to knowing for every student and every staff member to know that they are, um, they matter, right? Um, I think also, um, you know, checking in, right? Those check-ins with students and staff about have you had enough time? Well, for, and actually these are kind of along the same lines, but there's a lot of themes that are in parallel with students and staff. Do you have enough time to prepare and plan? Um, our teachers have a lot of, you know, they have to reconcile the curriculum development that they have to do, the IB, the PBAs. So do they have enough support to do that? And then all of their context just changed with COVID as well. So it just exacerbated everything that was um, difficult to do and, and probably juggled before. And so making sure that our staff has that support and then our students, um, as they juggle the activities, their own classwork, do they have enough time? And giving, building in maybe those mental health breaks for students and staff and not just, you know, cause everybody needs it. And I think now with COVID more, um, we need those breaks of, you know, maybe not so many meetings and more time to just take a break, have a day off, have a half day off, you know, like just breathe, everybody go do something, you know, unexpected that'll, that'll hopefully recharge um, some students and staff. And then, um, yeah, going back to the stress levels that students and staff are facing. Um, I completely agree with what Chair Litton was saying as well. And like I said, it was here before and uh, COVID just made them a lot more in focus. Thank you. Thank you. All right, Natalie, I think we can move on to the next one. Perfect, thank you all. I think one thing that I, I heard as a through line throughout was looking uh, closely at both burnout, stress and anxiety while also really maintaining the focus on creating an environment that is safe for students and staff as well as creating uh, and maintaining that sense of belonging for both. So with, Dre, with that, Dre, I'll hand it over to you for the next question. Perfect. Um, next question is, um, you know, heading in more of the organizational resources. Um, how can we improve the school division's fiscal transparency in the budgeting process to ensure that the community understands the information and that we are developing sustainable processes and procedures? And why don't we, for this one, I'll let people raise their hands if they have a thought so we can people don't feel the need to repeat. So any thoughts on this one? Dr. Anderson, go ahead. Uh, thank you, Chair Litton. Uh, I'll start out by saying, I think over the last few years, um, we've made great strides in this area already um, through the work that Ms. Michael and her staff have been doing in particular. Um, Every step of the budget process has been re-examined um, and you know, it's all out there in the public. It's all out there open for everybody to see and, and we get the questions, but um, I think that's been a big, uh, big improvement in that over the last few years. I would say the remaining places that I think we could do even more would be to make sure that um, we're in the process of developing the budget, providing lots of opportunities for people to come forward and, and say, I think you need to be putting more emphasis here, or I'm concerned about this one item that you're talking about doing and making sure that there's a dialogue back and forth um, for us to hear from the, from the community and the community hear from us. We already do public hearings on that, but those are usually people coming and talking to us and us not saying a whole lot back in the other direction. Um, that's 
the hearings are, are like, but finding ways to make sure that we're having a, a bit more dialogue. And, um, you know, the, there's only so much we can do to ensure that the community uh, understands the information. I think there's a lot that, that we've already done in trying to make it easier to understand and clearer and how did we get from point A to point B. Um, so I think it's just at this point, I would say um, more dialogue and, and some opportunities if, if people have specific items, areas that they feel like they need a little bit more focus for us to create structures that let that happen. But again, I, I will go back to where I started and say, I think we've done a lot here over the last few years, especially under uh, with Ms. Michael's leadership on this one. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Other thoughts on this item? Um, Vice Chair Downs. Yes, and, and I'll echo, I think Ms. Michael and her team have, have done a terrific job. I remember um, years ago, a lot of people in the community talked about there was a lack of transparency and I don't hear those complaints any longer. Um, but I do think, and I believe, I think we've done a good job us, utilizing actually morning announcements a lot. And um, I know Mr. Brett has a role in that as well. Um, but sort of, you know, using, um, summarizing some of the budget things and sort of little chunks where people can quickly sort of understand. I know that um, over the years we've done sort of a um, FAQ, sort of a, you know, what does this mean? And then sort of an explanation and, and just sort of like bite-sized nuggets. And I know, I think that's been really good. And also the, um, often this board, when we ask questions, we ask, they're um, questions at the community. They're not really, our questions are more sort of layman questions, like help us understand this. And so I think it's been really good when we've done links and then more announcements to the school board members questions and those answers because I think that is a really nice way to explain it so I think I guess I'm saying just more of the same I think that we've done really a great job um, utilizing I would say more announcements I think is the best way to do it is just to so, sort of um, again not you know the community doesn't need a 500 page you know budget report but what they do need is sort of summarizing and explaining what these things mean and I think um, Ms. Michael and her team and, and Mr. Brett have done a really good job with that thank you Great, thank you, Vice Chair Downs. Dr. Dimmick? I agree wholeheartedly with everything that's been said. And, and I think, thank you for your work, Ms. Michael. Um, the only thing I could come up with when I was sort of poking around and thinking about this question and I went to the budget page and I, I also had been to our policy page was if there's some sort of easy short explanation that we can put on some of our pages, like on the budget page, could we, is there, you know, just a sort of, this is how the budget works. And this is when the process starts. And this is, you know, like where the money comes from, or just sort of pretty basic things that, you know, unless you're, unless you come to the meetings and go to the hearings, you just don't know. And granted, I don't know if anyone's going to look for that on the website, but um, maybe. And then I was on the policy page and I thought to myself, what if someone actually wanted to look for a policy? Like, how do you figure out which category is the policy in? Like, so just pretty simple things. But other than that, I think we're on the right track. I think we've done well. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Uh, Dr. Anderson. Thank you, Charlotte, and for a, a go back on this one. I think another thing that's that's been a strength over the last few years is, Dr. Noonan, when, when you walk through the budget process with everybody, we start in the fall, right? And then here's what's happening. But then it's that first presentation in January and making clear that this is how this originated and this is how we got here and communicating that out. And then at the stage when the board has taken action and said, this is the board's advertised budget, what are we gonna do? And making sure that that step is clear and then going on and go forth. So it's building on that communications piece and trying to make sure that folks sort of see that. But that's definitely been something at least I've heard from folks appreciating that that clarity as well. So great, thanks. Any other comments or thoughts on this one? All right, not seeing any. I will turn it back to Ed Elements. Thank you for that. Just one question briefly before we move on. Um, can anyone speak to the developing sustainable process and procedures? I know we talked a lot about the fiscal transparency, so I appreciate you all sharing about that, but just wanted to just give people an opportunity if they want to share before we move on to the next question. Looks like we have a hand raised. 
Go ahead, Dr. Anderson. Sorry, I don't mean to be um, like taking over this conversation. I guess my answer to that would be the question it is really a question for Dr. Newton and Ms. Michael, because my sense of it is that over the last few years, you have already developed um, a good process and for answering our questions, for getting us the information. And it's it's been over those years, figuring out what the board wants to have. And, and in many cases, we now have it at the first stage. We don't have to ask for it. But whether that's sustainable is really a question that I sort of feel like needs some input from the folks who are actually doing that you know, on the ground work. So I, I guess I'm looking, Dr. Noonan, to you and Ms. Michael. For I don't know if we, you, if, Natalie, are we allowed to answer questions here? <laughs> <laughs> I, I'm gonna just, I'll just make a statement. How about that? Okay. Um, and, and I just, I wanna echo some things that have set, been already said about uh, Ms. Michael and, and the work that she and Ms. Kopic have done on the budget over the past several years. Um, I, I would say this, uh, each year, um, I think we strive to do one more thing with the budget that makes it even better than it was before. And I think what we're trying to achieve is, so there's there are these external agencies that look at school budgets. So it's VASBO and GASBY and all of these different groups that look at these budgets. Um, and I think what we said to, what I said to Kristen when she arrived is, we want an award-winning budget <laughs> here in the city of Falls Church. And she said, give me a few years and we can get there. And I think that we are really close with all of the things that have been happening. So um, because it has become sort of part of our routine practices now and sort of the way that we answer questions, the processes that we put in place, cataloging them, dating them, putting together in, into folders and the like, um, the more routine things are, the more sustainable they are, I guess, sort of a, to your point. Um, so I think that, and I won't speak on behalf of Kristen, I'll, I'll certainly let her speak for herself, but I do think that our budget process has been um, smooth for the last several years, and I think it is sustainable. And I don't wanna forget the piece around some of the revenue sharing that also has sort of smoothed things out over the last several years. Um, but I, I would say that on balance, it's it's sustainable, and each year we're trying to do one step further, one more thing to make it even even better than it was. Ms. Michael, thank you all for um, all of the positive feedback. I truly appreciate it. When I think of developing sustainable processes, the other thing that I really think about is what is our long term vision, and are we sure we sure that we're putting things in place that are gonna sustain us for the long-term? And then how do we ensure that the investments we're making in the short-term are here for the long-term? So for me, I'll give you a great example of that. We have a beautiful new high school, right? We have made some significant investments in our facilities in the city, which is just truly commendable. But we need to be sure that the processes that we're putting in place are ensuring that those resources are sustainable for our students, that they maintain that same high caliber of the buildings so when I think of sustainable processes, I think of that sustainable long-term budgeting to ensure that our capital improvement plan can keep all of our facilities and resources for our students where they need to be. So we're sure um, that we're not falling behind and trying to catch up. So for me, that's one of the things I think we need to work towards. So Ms. Michael went global. I went narrow because <laughs> I was thinking more about work processes and, and fl workflow. Um, so I think I think um, between the two of us, I think that um, we would agree that we have a pretty sustainable um, system at, at the moment. Great, thank you guys. Thank All you, right. thank you. Thank you, Dr. Anderson and Dr. Noonan and Ms. Michael for sharing as well. Uh, Mr. Redinger, did you have something that you wanted to share? No, I'm good, thank you. Okay. All right. So we are going to move to our last question before we do a closing reflection here. And this you'll, you'll recognize kind of toggles between organizational resources and also community engagement. Some of this was mentioned earlier in the first question where we talked about staff, but what we're looking for here is we wanna hear from you all, how are we supporting the division to address both the recruitment and retention? So how are we bringing people in? How are we making them aware of Falls Church? And then how are we retaining our staff? And Chair Litton, we'll turn it over to you. 
All right, thank you. And we will once again go ahead and do hands raised. So anybody have thoughts they'd like to share on this one? Vice Chair Downs. Thanks so much. Um, I, I think, frankly, is um, not one of, the, I guess, I guess I'm not so new anymore. But um, I think I would frankly like to learn a little bit more about about our the nitty gritty of recruiting and, and retaining students. Um, I don't think we've um, gotten into not that we want to get into the weeds, because that's Dr. Noonan's responsibility, but just to have a little bit of a more of an understanding of that, I will say that I think um, you know, one of the things with recruitment is that our school system has strived in terms of uh, staff and teacher size strive to keep up with our surrounding school systems, um, and we've done a good job. I think um, if I, I, I believe that we're still when we look at um, teachers who are at the middle of their career, it's still hard for us to keep up with our neighboring um, school system in terms of salary. So I think that is something that um, you know we need to continue to, to work on. Um, and then the only other thing I would say in terms of retention is maybe, and we might already do this again, I don't know, but um, having exit interviews for teachers so we understand why they're leaving. Um, and you know, obviously sometimes someone's moving, but sometimes it could be an indicator, an exit interview may give you a, look into something that's more systemic and more, more and, and deeper and something that needs to be addressed. So I guess those would just be my two in terms of retention is really looking at that, the pay scale and, and again, trying to figure out when, when we do have people leaving, why they're leaving. Thanks. Great, thank you, Vice Chair Downs. Uh, Mr. Reitinger. Thank you, Chair. I think I'd highlight a couple of things here. Um, one, uh, to, uh, branch off what the vice chair just said, but make it slightly broader. You know, a key focus of the boards since the, really since I've been on it, has been on uh, treating the staff well, making sure that this is a good place to work. Um, and I think compensation is a part of that, but there's a lot more that goes into that. For example, small class sizes are something that um, we believe helps draw teachers to Falls Church and staff members to Falls Church. Um, <clears throat> I think we've got, we, we have worked hard, but we've got more work to do around professional development. But I think it, 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 it has been and needs to continue to be a focus um, for the school board. Um, how do we make sure that the best teachers want to come to work in Falls Church? because they're given the best opportunity to fulfill their own mission, which is to teach kids. Um, the second thing um, I'd say is, I, I think we, we have um, drilled down specifically, and I pull out or call out um, our recently passed diversity, equity, and inclusion policy um, to specifically draw emphasis on increasing the uh, uh, diversity of the candidate pool um, of staff we are trying to recruit. Um, I think that that needs to be a continuing focus and the, the policy called for regular and periodic reports on how we're doing. So I think we've set up the means to um, monitor to that and take action as necessary. Thank you, Mr. Reitinger. Uh, Dr. Dimmitt. Thank you. I agree with what's been said. I also, I want to, I guess, add a little bit more on retention. I think we need to be a great place to work. Um, pay is important, but if you look at why teachers leave their positions, and even if you think of your own job, job history, you know, having a great boss is important. If you if you are dissatisfied with your administration, you will be less happy in your school. If you're if there are additional burdens placed on the teachers that take them away from their sort of core classroom time, then that might lead to dissatisfaction and retention issues. Um, and so I think climate surveys are important. Um, we need to know um, what how our teachers feel in order to sort of have a sense of what's going on and. And we have to keep being a good place to work so people want to come here, but also with that once they come, they, they want to stay. Thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Uh, Mr. Henderson. 
Yes. Uh, I'll uh, agree with Phil that uh, it is important to have a diverse um, faculty uh, in our schools because the world is a diverse place. Uh, and as far as retention goes, I've worked in both good school systems and bad school systems. And other than pay uh, to retain teachers, the resources and specialists that can come in when, when, uh, there, is, then when there are issues is a very important um, thing to consider in retaining uh, teachers and creating a, uh, a uh, work environment that's conducive to um, wanting teachers to stay in their school systems. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. Any, Phil, I don't know if your hand is raised for this one or from before. No. All right. Any other thoughts on this? I guess my two cents on this is that I agree with what everybody has said. And I actually think, I think we're going to face a lot more problems on this in the future, not just in our district, but because of just sort of a nationwide issue that we have with valuing teachers and bringing teachers into the profession. So, I mean, I think we have to focus on this because unfortunately, I think the competition is gonna get, continue to get greater and greater. And I do think it's, you know, a point we're gonna need to make with the city council that, you know, teacher pay is going to need to continue to be raised. We're going to need to offer good benefits. Um, I just think we got a long way to go on this one. Um, there's a lot of work to be done and a lot of it's much broader than, than us, but we're a good place to start. So um, yeah, so with that, I will turn it back to you guys if no one else has anything. So. Thank you. Thank you for, for all sharing different ideas, both related to recruitment and retention. So we are going to move into our closing here and I will turn it over to Katie. Perfect, thanks Natalie. So just a final check out for you all and reflecting on all the different top topics that we discussed tonight, if you could take one um, immediate next step or make one immediate change, what would it be? And, and feel free to either zoom in if there's a specific action that you have in mind or zoom out if it's more of a topic, a broader topic that you would want to prioritize as far as thinking about next steps. And Chair Linton, over to you. Great, thank you. And I'll open the floor for any ideas on this. Um, Dr. Dimmick, go ahead. All right. Well, I was trying to imagine with this one, okay, if I wave my magic wand, what could I like do that's, you know, not already in the schedule because we're all pretty booked up. I, I guess I'm thinking ahead to sort of the parent teacher conferences that are going to happen next week. And I guess if I could wave a magic wand, I would give the teachers more time to spend thinking about their students and um, then allow for a not necessarily more time next week, but another check-in later in the school year where um, teachers have time to prepare for it and parents have an opportunity to hear again how their students are doing. I think there's a lot of concern with for parents that not just with their students academically, but their students social emotionally and wanting to know what's going on in school. And, and we only do this once a year. And it, if I could change something, I, I might have it be more than once a year. Great, thank you, Dr. Dimmick. Phil, is your hand raised? Sorry. It, <laughs> it is. Ahead. So uh, I'm, I'm a big proponent of, you know, sort of tactical steps towards strategic plans. And if I only could pick like one thing to sort of make a requirement or a new policy, I'd say what's the most important thing and the most important thing in my view, and I think most people's view of training students well is a high quality and happy staff, um, retaining them, having the best teachers, administrators, paraprofessionals, and everyone else. If the, the best staff make the best schools. And so that means we need to have the best teachers. Um, and that means more than anything else, we need to retain the best teachers. 
Um, and that means treating them fairly. And I, I agree with, as I said before, and Dr. Demick said before, there's a lot more than just pay. But I think the most important thing in treating teachers fairly and teaching staff fairly is to give them a step every year. So I would, I would say we should make it a board policy and it is our practice, but it ought to be effectively an understood thing that we will always give staff a step. You know, there may not be a call, but they will get a step every year, um, except in the case of a fiscal exigency. And I think we ought to do our absolute best to make that happen. Great, thank you, Mr. Reidinger. Uh, Vice Chair Downs. Uh, I, I would like to suggest um, that, and this is when it says immediate, I, I don't know, it's not like as immediate as Dr. Dimmick, but maybe in the you know upcoming years is doing, as Dr. Dimmick mentioned, a climate survey with teachers, but also, um, surveying our students and our parents on a, on a regular basis. I think that, um, you know, I hear from um, parents and not as much students, but I think that would just be good for us. Know, just yeah. Having the having a, having a ability to have um, an annual survey where people know that they can um, give feedback on, on whatever, whatever it is. And I think it speaks a lot to, you know, retaining our teachers, having, letting them have some input on how things are going. Um, assessing how they're feeling about working at the school, but also, again, hearing from parents and students of what we could be doing better. So I think just some sort of um, annual formal way that that our community can offer feedback to improve our schools would be great. Thanks. Thank you, Vice Chair Dance. Any other thought? Mr. Henderson, mm -hmm. go ahead. Uh, one other important thing in retaining teachers is not only salary, but the benefit package. And um, the benefit package represents a large part of uh, what teachers receive. And whether that's medical, retirement, or what have you. One of the things that, um, and I, I know this might be totally on. on acceptable or sustainable here in a small jurisdiction like um, Falls Church. But when I taught in Fairfax County, they had a supplemental retirement as well, which was um, quite effective, uh, but it only, um, it was to supplement the retirement until the teacher receives full social security benefits. And after that, there was just a small um, uh, payment that would go out to you, might be enough for maybe a dinner for four. <laughs> but um, it really helped between your retirement age and when you turned um, full social security. And uh, that was called ERFC, which was the Fairfax County uh, Supplemental Retirement System. Um, I don't know that with small jurisdiction, that may not be something that, uh, that we're able to do here, but I think that that would be a, a really uh, good thing for teachers to have as well. Thank you, Mr. Henderson. All right. Phil, I don't know if you have your hand up again or is that from before? Okay, just making sure. All right, any final thoughts? from the group on this? All right, I, I think that's it. Thank you, thanks Chair Linton for facilitating that. I'm gonna close out here. So as we're closing out, just wanna thank you all for taking the time for in inviting us into this session, for giving us a chance to hear from you all. What are some of your hopes and aspirations? Where do you wanna see Falls Church next week? Where do you wanna see Falls Church in a month, in a year and five years down the road? It's incredibly helpful to be able to hear from you the perspectives that you've heard from your community, experiences that you all have had in different roles that you've had. I'm really excited to have a student rep here tonight as well and appreciate you sharing alongside. Um, we do want to put a plug and a reminder for our town hall that's coming up this Thursday. So for anyone that is watching at home or that is participating, or if you want to encourage your community members, your colleagues, your staff as well, um, the town hall will be an opportunity to focus again around the four domains.
things that we talked through tonight, um, and it will give us a chance to hear from even more community members. There is a bit.ly here. John has been great at helping to promote and put the word out in morning announcements um, and in newsletters, and it's on the website as well. But there is a bit.ly that you can sign up and register. It will be a virtual town hall. We look forward to that, to have a chance to hear from more community members and as well as we wrap up some of our focus groups over the next week. So we thank you all. Thank you for inviting Drea and Katie and I here tonight. And we are just really excited to be along with you all on this process. Madam Chair, can I just say one, one more thing before um, the, the team leaves, just thank you so much for your incredible support. Um, one of the things that we wanna make sure everybody understands, including the board, is that a lot of the work that, and the legwork that Ed Elements is doing, and then those um, folks that are on the steering committees that are also uh, facilitating those uh, focus groups and conversations really are meant um, to serve you all as a board to bring you information from the community about what their hopes and aspirations and dreams are too. So sort of to your point, Vice Chair Downs, about you know, getting feedback from the community. This has been the, one of the greatest ways we've been able to gather feedback um, since I've been here is through doing this process. And we have now over 400 people that we've had a chance to gather feedback from about these four different domains. So while your feedback is incredibly important tonight and your visioning and your asp aspirational goals for us as a school division are really important, um, I, I think having that other aspect of the information coming in from the community so that we're reflective also of what the community desires um, is going to be equally important. So um, I just want to thank Ed Elements again for helping lead us through that um, and look forward to doing the town hall later this week. Great. Thank you. And on behalf of the board, thank you guys for being here tonight. We appreciate it. Thank you. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye. All right. We will move on to the next item on our agenda, which is 2.02 legislative advocacy and priorities. And um, I know we have Dr. Anderson is kind of leading some of this. I don't know. Do you want me to turn anything over to you or, or to Dr. Noonan? Um, so for the first part, um, Ms. Wise, Ms. Lowell Wise has joined us and Dr. Noonan, if you want to do a quick intro, we should sure. do that. And then um, Ms. Wise will walk us through a, a draft set of uh, legislative positions for the board to think about. And then we've got some things to talk about for the DSBA meeting coming up and I can take care of that. Great. And I'll, I'll just go ahead and um, I'll do a quick-ish <laughs> intro just to say, uh, first of all, thank you to Ms. Wise for joining us this evening and your patience. Um, we did have our visioning session to do this evening and to Dr. Anderson for picking up the legislature, legislative package again. Um, I just wanted to share with the board um, that I'm coming off of uh, last week, um, the, the Virginia Association of School Superintendents meeting um, down in Charlottesville. And while uh, we were down in Charlottesville, we had an opportunity to meet with our regional um, legislative um, liaisons. And our, our regional legislative liaison is um, Dave Sovine, who's the superintendent in Frederick County. But at the same time, we had a chance to hear from um, uh, two um, senators uh, from the legislature as well, um, and then hear from some other advocates for school funding, um, including Jim Regenbaugh, who does some work, just about, not an advocate, but he's, a, he's an information giver. Of, of budget. Um, and I, I wanted to share with you as you're starting your conversations about legislative agenda pieces, kind of the big thing that the superintendents are paying a lot of attention to this coming year, uh, because it does appear that from a state, from a state level, and, and I'll quote Jim Regenbaugh here, um, and who's he with? He's not Mark Five, he's with- um, Force Five Analytics. Force Five Analytics. I always wanna say Mark Five, but Force Five Analytics. Um, but he's been doing this work for about 25 years. And his direct quote was, I've been doing this work for 25 years and I've never seen so much money coming into the state of Virginia before in my life. Uh, and then went on to say, this is the year to really press the legislature to do some things um, that perhaps weren't done in the past. And so uh, coming out of the conference that I was in, all of that is a long way of saying that out of the conference that um, that the superintendents attended was this real push, I think, 
to focus in, and, and this is, you know, certainly the purview of the board, whether you want to go there or not, but I will tell you that VAS is, is to really push on the support cap piece. Um, as you know, the support cap was eliminated um, or vastly reduced during the recession. Um, and, and there is quite a bit of um, money currently that's in the state coming in with revenues and about $250 million that weren't spent last year also that could be put in to, to take care of the support cap. And one of the things that's really hard about the support cap argument is what exactly is the support cap and why, why is it important? And, and I'll just give you a couple of examples. There are a couple of things that are support cap. Support means support in schools, right? And in the standards of quality, um, the state funds things like teachers, the state funds things like technology specialists um, and the like, but the state doesn't fund things like assistant principals or school counselors or um, paraprofessionals. Um, and all of those positions ultimately need to be paid for by the locality because the support cap, the support positions were taken out of the budget during the recession. So our advocacy is really to put the support positions back in the budget um, and not cap the amount that we get for those positions. Um, so my hope is that in this Friday update, I'll be able to better inform you about all of the positions that are in the support position category that we pay for locally and get no money from the state or very little money from the state to pay for. Um, but the other thing to consider, and, and this is something that we're considering as an organization in VAS too, is if the state legislature decides we're not gonna take the whole support positions and put them all back into the standards of quality. What we have said, I think that's gonna come out as part of our positions is, if you don't take all the positions, at least put the assistant principals and the paraprofessionals into the support position, into the SOQ. Because if those go into the SOQ, that means that then the state will fund our paraprofessionals and our assistant principals. Um, which they don't fund now, which will save us local dollars down the line. So anyway, I just wanted to let the board know and let Lilla know and, and Dr. Anderson as our legislation legislative person know that, that is, that's a big piece of what the Virginia Association of School Superintendents will be sort of fighting for um, going forward. Um, thank you. Um, thank you, Dr. Noon. I just wanted to make sure that that was changed like way back in 2008, right? Like 2009. 2009. Like, when you say the recession, we're talking a while ago. So I mean, correct. <laughs> it was a while ago. I just it's not COVID. It's actually the recession from what. Yeah. So, um, what I mean, why? I don't know. I'm I'm just I I just I know I've only been on the school board two years. I feel like we keep talking about this, and and I mean, do you think this is the year that it could happen because of? the state's in a better financial position? So we asked um, both senators that were on the panel, there were only two of them. One was George Barker from Northern Virginia. And I, Lilla, you, I think you may have listened in, but I can't remember who the other one, other person was, um, but he was, a, he was a Republican from Southside, Virginia. And we asked point blank, would you support putting this, would you support putting the support positions back into the budget? And both of them said, yes. So I think it, it is a year of possibility for us, particularly if we work with um, Senator Saslaw and also with um, Delegate Simon, I, I think both of them are on board. Um, I think that's the one nice thing about our Senator and our, our um, uh, House representative is that um, they are sort of in, in favor of doing this. So I think it is the year if we're gonna push to really push. Um, the, one, the one other thing, Lilla, um, that we talked about, just by the way, is that um, another way that would save localities money, since there is a surplus, is they could put some of that surplus into the VRS trust fund. And if they put some of that money into the VRS trust fund, that would then reduce our responsibility in the retirement system. Um, and that's not just a one-time savings, that could be a long-term savings for us as a school division. So knowing that they have $250 million of excess from last year, what if they took that money and put it into the trust fund and saved localities money 
down the line. So that's just another, another thing to think about. So with that as a, <laughs> a brief introduction. Um, uh, pardon, Mr. Could, I, could I ask a question? Uh, oh, sure, go ahead, Mr. Reininger. Um, thanks, I just wanted to ask Dr. Noonan, the, but putting the support cap, the support positions back in the budget still would leave them subject to the local composite index, <laughs> correct? Yes, yes that, that's absolutely correct. So we still would only get roughly 20% of each position, but that 20% is better than zero. Un understood, but I have to say that it doesn't make it a really high priority, at least for me, um, because it is just 20%. Whereas if money goes into the retirement system, then it's not subject to the local composite index, right? True. Yeah. Um, so I I'd be much more interested in taking money and putting it into something like the retirement system where that's fairly distributed across all Virginia. And I, you know, I think there's a, there's a strong justification for doing it um, or in you know, doing things like maybe moderating the adverse effects the local composite index has, not taking the people who get the most money and taking less from them, but giving money to the people who only get the 20% or the 19% or whatever it is. Um, but between the two, I, you know, I'm not sure it's our fight um, uh, to uh, comparatively to worry about getting the admin budgets, the agent positions back in the budget when we'd only get 20% covered. All right, thank you, Mr. Reidinger. So- but I, Could I respond to that? Oh, sure, go ahead, Lola. Sure, you'll be very happy to hear, and uh, Kristen can tell us even more, that VRS has already looked at the rates for the next uh, fiscal year, and they are being reduced by what, about 2% two, two Kristen? Correct, almost 2%. So that will be a big thing for school divisions and it will be for the state government too, so. Great, thank you, Lilla. All right, yep. I'm assuming we wanna go over the, the package you guys have put together now. Mr. Anderson, so I don't know, should I turn it over to you or Lilla? Um, well, I'll, I'll take it and then immediately hand it over to, to Ms. Wise, um, <laughs> who has sent us all a draft set of language with some legislative positions, some of which is not all that different from what was in the, the vast discussion we just had. So there's a little bit of alignment there. Um, these are draft positions that we can yes. take time to talk about. And then um, in December, typically, is when we approve our our final package of legislative positions. So um, Lily, do you wanna, wanna take us through this? Sure, like to go ahead. Um, this year is very different than any year I've ever seen because of two things that are happening. Number one, as Dr. Noonan has said, there's a lot more money. The other thing is that during this election, when you have looked at all or heard all these ads on television, what do most of them have to do with? Education. They have put education as a top priority, which I've not seen at this, at this stage before. So a lot of people are looking, what are we going to do in education? How can we do it better? So let me go over with you some of the things that we have here. Our first and foremost uh, position would be uh, restoring the support cap. As we said, 2009 was when they took it away and it would be helpful even if it's just 20%. Then I've got a couple of other positions in here for funding ones, supporting funding to protect school divisions from enrollment loss. As you know, most school divisions this year are not going to have as many students as they have had in the past. And school funding is dependent upon average daily membership. So we're looking at being held harmless for any losses in uh, enrollment and support hey, additional funds. Can I, can I interrupt, can I interrupt sure, you just very sure. quickly? Because one of the things in that position from a vast perspective is we suggested that it be, uh, that we, it be quantified by a number of years, either three year, for the next three years or the next five years. And, and that's up okay, obviously sure. to the board, but um, we did put a number in there. Okay. 
Okay, the next is uh, to support additional funding uh, to address lost learning due to COVID. Uh, most of that will probably be uh, federal funding, but we're hoping that much of, a lot of that will come to the schools. We are looking at uh, supporting the uh, full funding of the standards of quality. The State Board of Education last week just um, went ahead with new standards of quality. Actually, they've not been very new. They've been pretty much the same ones that they've sent to the General Assembly for a number of years, but this may well be the time when some of those will be fully funded. Um, this is a, a relatively new one. We're talking about e e EL students. And state funding for EL students is essentially a ratio, number of students to number of teachers. And what we're requesting and uh, supporting will be that uh, be uh, funded based on the level of students. For example, if you have a number of students in levels one and two who really are more difficult to, uh, to work with, that you would have a better ratio for them than you would for the students who are at level five. So this is something I think we had in our package last year and uh, definitely are going to hopefully put that in for this year. Then we've got a, a couple of interesting um, positions in our draft uh, legislation. The first is something that uh, is called the Halifax model. And Halifax is one of the school divisions with crumbling schools. And as you know, there's been an awful lot of talk about school construction and school modernization, especially in parts of the state where their schools are 50, 60, 70 years old. And so two years ago in General Assembly, Halifax County came in and said, could we do something like having a 1% sales tax that would go to school uh, construction or modernization? And the way they put it out there is we would have a referendum, ask our voters if they wish to do that. And if they do that, then we have the 1%. That was approved. They've used it, it's worked. Since then, a number of school divisions have said, wait a minute, that seems to have worked for them. Why not let us do it too? So last year during General Assembly, there were four or five more school divisions who got added to the code and they went ahead, they had referendums, the referendums were approved and they had more funding for school construction or modernization. So what this position would be, would be to, instead of having school divisions having to go to General Assembly and asking to be put into the code, just make this uh, procedure statewide which would mean that a false church wanted to do something like this and had a referendum and your folks said, yes, fine, let's do that. You could have a 1% sales tax that would go directly to school modernization and uh, construction. I know you're not gonna be constructing much, but in the past, in future, who knows what needs you're gonna have. Of course, you've seen it every year since I've been around, and that's cost of competing. And we just want cost of competing to go ahead and be a uh, part of the, the budget, maybe even increase it a little bit. And then opposing any diversion of public education funds to non-public schools. And certainly in some of the things that we have been hearing and reading in this election, there has been a lot of talk out there about no, you don't have to send your kids to public schools. Yes, we're going to support private schools. And so I think it's really important, even though we've had this in our legislative package for a number of years, that we iterate that uh, we feel very strongly about this. Then we've got a couple of new positions. The first one in a, a couple of football games in Northern Virginia this fall have turned very ugly. And they have been situations where the football players were making racial remarks to others. They were spitting on them. Uh, there were fights. And it seemed like the referees and the coaches were not handling this in an appropriate way. So what we're looking for, and this came out because these were things that happened in Arlington and in Alexandria, as far as football games were concerned, is supporting um, mechanisms to help prevent bullying, discrimination, 
racism and all forms of violence during, it's just interscholastic, interscholastic high school sports. That may not be something you want to keep in your package, but uh, it's something here for your consideration. Another one that I think that you will find very interesting, and Dr. Anderson and I talked about it, and he gave me some really great advice on some ways to look at it, and that is supporting legislation that would give option for school division advisory bodies to meet electronically. Now, as I've talked to some of my colleagues, they've said, why are you just saying advisory bodies? Why can't it be, you know, other people? And as Dr. Anderson said, if we really want to recruit people to be on school boards and to do this hard work, we need to make it easier for them, especially if they're younger people, they have children at home, they have jobs. And so why are we making it so hard that everybody has to come in person? So this is another uh, uh, new issue that uh, put out there for your consideration. And then the last one you've had, you've seen before, and that's legislative changes to allow school divisions to use performance-based assessments for all end of course standards of learning assessments. And uh, we had one legislator over the years who was so adamantly opposed to this and was able to put roadblocks in the way of school divisions doing this. So. Let's hope that uh, perhaps uh, because there's certainly the state board supports this and uh, there's a lot more support for this. So that is what I have for your draft. Make any changes that you would like to it uh, and uh, answer any questions you might have. Great, thank you, Ms. Wise. Um, go ahead, Dr. Anderson. Thank you. Sure, uh, thank you for that. Um, and thanks, Lola. One thing that I think might be useful before we take questions about any of the particular positions, there's sort of two things. One is uh, I can talk very briefly, although we have more to come after this quick discussion um, about some of the VSBA positions. And I'll just say to cut to the chase that about three out of the things that are in this position overlap with VSBA positions. So, so that would be there. And then Dr. Noon has just relayed the vast information and, and at least two of the things in here overlap there as well. So there's a, a big confluence. The other one is how these positions get used. And Lola, do you wanna talk about once we've decided collectively in prior years, once we've decided collectively and told you, yes, we agree with these positions, what do you do with them? And then I can talk a little bit about what I expect we'll be doing with them in the next few months. So what do you do, what do, you do with them? And just so everybody has that context. Well, usually the first, around the 1st of December, we have a legislative meeting, Arlington Alexandrian Falls Church, and we have all of the legislators who represent us come to our meeting. And at that point, we discuss the things that we would like to see happen and they give us their feedback. Uh, so that's the first thing that we do with them. Then, obviously, during General Assembly, I work individually with legislators and their legislative aides and uh, help them understand why we're doing things, get information from, for them if they have any uh, questions about it, and really support their doing whatever we can. There are a number of times when I actually get up and I testify in committee meetings and subcommittee meetings. So that's essentially how we let legislators, not only our legislators, but all legislators know what our priorities are. Thanks, Lola. And then I'll just say the other thing that, that the legislative liaison for the board historically has done is we have taken these positions. And when we go to the VSBA meeting in, in the, the um, school board association meeting, and we're at the delegate assembly, we're able to sort of talk with the other delegates about some of the positions when we're talking just with other members of the, you know, of the association, we can talk. But the other thing is November is take your legislator to school month. And this is one way that the legislative liaison can be prepared to sort of help represent kind of the board's collective views on, on things that are important when talking with a legislator. Uh, and we'll be doing that uh, in the coming weeks. So it's a useful point for me as well. So anyway, I thought it might be helpful to have that context. That's helpful. Thanks, Greg. Um, then do you wanna go ahead and have a discussion on, 
on this now. Is that helpful? Probably okay. Go, okay. Uh, Vice Chair Downs, did you have something you want to mention? Yeah, I have it. Uh, Dr. Noonan, can you just, I, I guess I'm not understanding the very last point about the allowing school divisions to use performance-based assessments for all. Sure. Um, currently, um, we have, we've made, well, not currently, but in the past years, we've made shifts um, through the Virginia Department of Education to allow us to use locally developed performance-based assessments in, in exchange for the, the state standards of learning. And that assessment is developed based on the standards of learning for that particular course. And then students will do a performance-based assessment, whatever it is, um, whether it's uh, a, a project, whether it's some other um, performance. Um, and if they perform well on that based on a rubric and it's approved through our curriculum and assessment and evaluation process, um, and uses information that comes from the state, that then becomes the substitute for the SOL. So essentially what we're trying to do is push the state to say, you know, we trust school divisions to write their own assessments that are aligned to the SOLs because we have to teach the SOLs. Um, so let us, let us teach the SOLs through the appropriate means and then let us assess that through a project or a performance-based assessment. And we, but we did that, we've done that. We have done that in a couple of different content areas in uh, elementary. Okay, okay. I think actually, would that have been like a, my fifth grader took a history exam? I think that was a different name that seemed like instead of the SOL, I feel like. I when, when was that? Last year. I can't remember yeah. what it was called. There are some performance-based yeah. assessments at, in the elementaries. Right, yeah. right. Okay, I was just curious. I just didn't understand that. Um, and I, I guess my only one comment is, I, I guess this is, again, I'm not... Um, my area of expertise is definitely not uh, state or local politics, but I was just curious um, in terms of the sales tax issue, is that just something that has been, it's just state, that was something that the state controlled. But I, I just, I guess I was, and also when I read about it in the VSBA, I was surprised to see that localities couldn't do that without prior approval from the state. So I don't know, it's just a comment. I was, I was surprised at that, yeah, yeah, so. Okay, it, it all it all makes sense to me, and I think there is a lot of um, there is some overlap with VSBA, which is good. But so I thought it was thought it was great. Thanks. All right, are there uh, Phil? Do you have your hand up? Yeah, just a a relatively quick comment that I apologize in advance is going to be rather blunt, um, and that is I I, I don't agree that. Um, putting the, um, removing the support cap should be our number one priority. I, I, I don't think we should put as, an, as a jurisdiction, a substantial amount of effort into putting funds into the budget that we only get 20 cents on the dollar out of. Um, and that our focus Guess we can take other comments or questions. <laughs> um, Dr. Dimick. I guess a follow up on, on what Mr. Reinder was saying. Do, do we have a sense like for Falls Church, what would be most beneficial for us? His, his point is we shouldn't prioritize this. Maybe we should prioritize putting it into the retirement fund. How does that look for us budget-wise? What, what, what would be best? So what I always think of is not only what would be best, but what can you get enough support from the other people across the state to get past? So while something like putting money in VRS is a huge benefit to us, truly, and that's something that really benefited everyone, Right, as we look at the support cap, the support cap year over year over year is really turned into a ton of money and it's something that's negatively impacting every single jurisdiction in the state. So you can get support from people who have an LCI of 0.2 as well as our fellow jurisdictions that have an LCI of 0.8, right? So to me, that's a really important consideration. Um, both the, the VRS and the support cap have long-term financial implications. Um, but I, I really think it's very tough for wealthy jurisdictions to get other divisions in the state 
to agree in terms of making a change. And the support cap is one that people are very unified on. So I agree that this might be a great time for that. I was just going to add that we can quantify how much we've lost, how much we've lost over the last three years without the support cap or with the support cap being in place. Um, and, and we can certainly put that together for you and put it in a, in a note so you can see, but it's, you know, it's, it's over a hundred thousand dollars. I can't even remember what the number was last year, but it yeah, was, and it I was don't pretty significant. have that number, but in the Friday note too, we have statewide numbers that show since it was enacted, how much has been lost every single year. So we can try to give you the global and the local numbers. Great. Other questions or comments? I actually have one, Greg, just kind of a question comment on the all forms of violence during interscholastic, interscholastic high school athletics. I know it's specifically that because of some specific incidents, but I guess I would ask, do we want to limit it to interscholastic high school athletics? I mean, we certainly wouldn't want it at other sorts of school activities. Um, so just wondering if it could be even more general during any school activity. So it needs to stay limited like that for some reason. Yeah, when when Lola and I spoke uh, last week, this was one that I I I, I I'm not surprised to hear that comment um, from from the board. I, I would say my question to her at that point was: Is there a reason that we couldn't just say? All forms of violence, period, and just ends it. And you know, it would cover what the other divisions are really focused on. And Lila, you had a you had an answer about that one, and it might just be worth making sure everybody knows what the what the response was. Yeah, my I have two things to say. First thing that Arlington did bring this up at the SBA and requested that it be put in the VSBA legislative package. That was turned down. There were many school divisions that felt that VHSL uh, is already handling these kind of things and that they did not want to get involved in any situations with VHSL. The other reason that we just have it is athletics is it was our concern that it was the referees, the umpires, the coaches who really who need the staff development about handle, how to handle these things. And so at this point, it was just sort of uh, limited to that group. Gotcha, thanks. But, but it, is, it is our choice as a board, what we want to say on this one. And, and sure. you know, sure. if, if the board feels that it should end at violence or if there's some other language that sure. you want to, want to do that, certainly the final version of that it needs to reflect what we think so exactly are you looking for an opinion now or is this something you I, I, want us to mull over i think we have time easiest? to mull this over if we can um if i could sort of get some guidance soonish because i will be talking about this coming up but we have time also to talk about it at our next uh, meeting if the agenda allows and we've got the work session coming up too I, I don't want to overly influence um, your decision around this one. Uh, and I appreciate the, that the VHSL is trying to handle it from a, a VHSL perspective, but um, from an on the ground perspective, um, there are issues and it would be, um, it would be good to hit it from multiple angles. That would just be my thought. Uh, Mr. Henderson. Uh, did, did we mention the reason why the mechanism for preventing bullying, discrimination, racism, and all forms of violence is restricted to interscholastic school athletics? Isn't this a problem everywhere across the board, not just in athletics? Yes, 
Mr. Anderson, as I was saying, when uh, Ms. Wise and I met last week, I was I, I told her that that was sort of my feeling on it too, was that the board was going to be asking exactly that question. Why why sh why would it be limited here? And Ms. Wise, Lola, will you, you want to explain again sort of why the, the language that's originally here, because this comes from Arlington and Alexandria City, right? Right. And maybe just explain again how that came about, and then we can decide as a board what we want to do with it. Okay, um, the first was a football game between Wakefield High School in Arlington and uh, Marshall High School in Fairfax. And during this game, Marshall play players used uh, racial language. Uh, they spit on um, players, uh, Wakefield players. The players went to the coaches. They went to the referees and said, can you please stop this? It never stopped. Finally ended up fights. Uh, kids were suspended. Um, one of the things that people felt was that if the, the adults who were in charge had taken a stronger stand in all this and had done something about it, it might not have gotten to that point. And so this is what they're talking about uh, as far as mechanisms, which would be staff development uh, developed by the, the Department of Education for coaches, uh, officials, referees, people who are the adults at these football, at these interscholastic uh, activities. Yeah, but we need a mechanism across the board. This is not, are you saying that this is not something that you can get support of in the legislature? Or are you saying well, there's not a need to have a mechanism across the board? I, I guess I would say, Mr. Anderson, I'm not taking a, a stance on that one right now, but my answer would be, I, I think we certainly, if we want to have a mechanism that's across the board, we should ask for it. I don't know whether there's the support in the legislature for that, but that doesn't mean we shouldn't ask for it if that's what we think we need. I think we need it. Okay. Sure. Well, this, this was focused on the interscholastic um, the sports. It was not focused on everything, but there's an awful lot of things going on with uh, cultural competency that may well apply across the board for everybody. Um, as you probably know, a lot of our coaches, a lot of the officials, they are not employees of the school divisions. Well, they are the, uh, the coaches, are, but they are not usually employees. They're outside people. And your officials are not employees of the school divisions. And so that's why we sort of focused on them. But uh, certainly, you know, it's your legislative package. And if you feel that that's the way you want it, of course, that's the way you'll have it. And that's the way we'll support it. And, and the only reason, Ms. Anderson, that I'm not, you know, it's like stating my own position right now is I'm trying to represent our position sure, collectively, sure. right? So I kind of want to hear what everybody else thinks. And then my job is to be a, a pipeline. Well, as you know, we've had issues with, this type of um, problem here in our own school system just recently, you know? So this isn't just something that happens on the football field. This is something that happens in the schools and there should be some mechanism to deal with that or to prepare people to deal with that. My, my two cents. Um, would it would it be helpful, Mr. Anderson, if we made a decision on this now, this language? Or would you like people to mull it over for a while? So I, th I think, I, I guess what it would be helpful right now, and this is only because, um, well, this is, there's two reasons why I think this part would be helpful right now is, um, Lola needs to be sort of thinking about how to revise things and there are discussions coming up in November that, that lead to December. Uh -huh. The other reason that it would be helpful for me to know sooner is um, for discussions that we have with take your legislature, a legislator to work uh, to school day, which is coming up you know, uh, next week, basically. So I don't know that I necessarily need the exact language, but what I need is a sense of the board's perspective on whether they whether we want to 
make this broader um, and not just athletics, but very generally, because Ms. Anderson, you're right. We, we have had these sorts of incidents even very recently. And I, I personally, this is not me as your liaison, but me as my, my own vote on this, would be that we should make it broader as well, because it isn't just athletics. And, you know, we had an incident last year as well. We had incidents last year as well regarding that. So I think it's an issue that we need to, uh, to uh, be broader on. And I hope that uh, the board will support that. I guess that's the question, Chair Litton, would be kind of, is there a sense of the board on not necessarily the precise language, but the whether we want this to be broader than just athletics or limited as it is now. Right. Okay. So I guess, does anybody have any further comments on this? And if not, I, I mean, I know I personally would support making it broader. So I guess I would ask, is anybody opposed to making it broader? I'm not seeing any opposition. So I think the sense is the, of the board is to make it broader. Okay, could, great. Could you explain exactly what you mean by making it broader? I'm not sure I have a real grasp of that. Do you, you want, want to, to try to take a stab at that, Jill? Well, my, under, my understanding is that we would take this item that the Falls Church School Board supports legislation to provide mechanisms to help prevent bullying, discrimination, racism, and all forms of violence and then just drop the during interscholastic high school sure. athletics. Yeah. So that it's not limited to uh -huh. the inner high school athletics. Do you yeah. agree with that, Mr. Anderson? Sorry. Yeah, I think that's what we're talking about. And if there's in between now and the final adoption, if there's some other language the board wants to consider, maybe we could have a discussion about this at our next work session in, in November, if the schedule allows, you know, we could do that. But I think certainly just ending it at the word at the phrase, all forms of violence, is sort of the sense that I'm getting from folks. Agreed. Yep. All right. Are there other thoughts and comments on positions? Uh, Mr. Anderson, Dr. Anderson? I just wonder if we should relate to Mr. Reitinger what happened after, um, with the item that he was talking about when, when he just was, when he was disconnected, so. <laughs> He knows that we, we continued the thread and we think we understand the point that you were raising, but um, do you wanna talk about what you asked Dr. Demick? It was helpful, I think. Sure, I just asked to get a, a sense of what it would mean for us, for our budget, um, which, what, what would be the priority. Um, And, and I think the response that, that we gave was um, that, uh, um, first of all, we'll quantify in the Friday update, um, hopefully this Friday, what the last three years of loss for us are as a consequence of not having the support cap. But there also was a general conversation, Mr. Reitinger, and it was around um, the, this idea of what, what legislation is more likely to to pass generally in the state. And the feeling that I think some of us have is that, you know, if we, uh, there are school divisions out there that have a 0.2 LCI and a 0.8 LCI, and they're all advocating the same position. Um, and there isn't, there aren't a whole lot of folks out there that are advocating for more in the, um, more going into the VRS. Um, because there are so many schools that are out there that are really getting pounded for not having that support, those support positions. So the feeling was, or at least from the staff perspective was, perhaps it would be an idea anyway, to go with the rest of the state because there's a lot of strength in numbers. Um, but I also wanna just say to the board that these don't have to be in, huh? Yeah, that's what I was gonna say. Um, these aren't necessarily, these don't have to be in rank order. And I think you could put both in as positions. You could put in the VRS uh, recommendation as well. So just a thought. All right. Any further thoughts on that issue or other issues anyone wants to bring up on this? Go ahead, Dr. Chair Linton. So, um, 
That was actually going to be the last comment, Dr. Noon, that you made. Mr. Reining, was going to be a suggestion that I was going to make, which is to, we could retain this position about the support cap, although move it further down or however else we want to package it so that it doesn't appear as the most prominent, even though I, I don't actually think that these are meant to be that way. But also put in there the, the discussion about the VRS uh, contribution. And the argument I guess I would make is um, we, can, we can try to get more support from our other divisions in the legislative side of things if we give them a little bit of what they really are looking for, which is the support cap, but also say, yes, that's important to us, but this is also really important to us. And you know, if we can demonstrate, here's what the fiscal impact is for us, it may be something that then gets those folks to think about what the fiscal impact is for them. Um, I don't know, it's just trying to find something that allows uh, both sides to get a little bit of, of support for the things that, that we think are important. And Mr. Reidinger has his hand up. Go ahead, Mr. Reidinger. Uh, thank you, Chair. Uh, thank you, Mr. Anderson. I'm, you know, Greg, I'm, I'm happy to negotiate, um, but what I don't wanna do is just go in and say, here's everything you want we, you know, would you consider some of the things that are important to us too? Um, I, I think it ought to be a negotiation and I'm happy to support generally, you know, things that are good for education across the state because they're good for education across the state. Um, but I really wouldn't put substantial calories arguing for anything, any funding that's subject to the local composite index. I mean, just speaking, you know, selfishly for the city, it'd be, a lot better to have those monies just given back to localities and then ask the city government to give us the money. Cause we get, you know, maybe we get 50 cents or 60 cents out of the dollar instead of 20 cents on the dollar. Um, in fact, it's almost irrational to argue for any money um, being spent by the state um, on things subject to the LCI because we get such a small percentage of it. So if there is in fact money um, that could go, I'd, I'd like to get something um, that not makes Falls Church City whole, but you know, for jurisdictions like us that have extremely low LCIs, help us a little bit, reduce some of the disadvantage if we're gonna take positions for the greater good. Um, and I actually feel really strongly about that. Um, and it's not just a point of emphasis, it's a point of, you know, if we're gonna negotiate, then we ought to negotiate. And if we're gonna take positions for the greater than good, then we ought to get something out of it for um, the students and the taxpayers of Falls Church City as well. Thank you, Mr. Reidinger. Um, oh, <laughs> Dr. Will, Anderson, where would you like to go from here? Uh, well, I, I think I have marching orders to some degree from, from folks and uh, I think Lola's been also probably yes, capturing I've some been taking well. notes. Mm -hmm. Um, and we do have time to finalize our discussion about, um, it, well, in, in essence, both our negotiating strategy and what the positions we want to be. So Mr. Reininger's points are very well taken. I think we should make sure that we get the information we need as a board to decide how we want to go with it. So, and then um, whenever whenever we're done talking about this, then we can I can talk about the VSBA package for uh, for folks as well. And and you know, uh, Ms. Wise, I'd be happy to have you stick around if you want, but. It's also getting late, so I don't want uh, to make you feel like you have to stay. Okay, so have we covered enough of the legislative package? Yes. Sounds like we have, Lilla. Yes, well, we you. have. Thank, thank you so much. <laughs> Thanks for being here. It's good to see you. All right, then, Greg, do you want to go ahead with the VSBA? Thank you, Chair Lynn. So um, the other part of this item is... Um, Every year, the VSBA develops its own legislative positions as a as a body, as an association, and um, each of the each of the member divisions has a legislative liaison that shows up to the delegate assembly and then votes on behalf of their division as to uh, whether to uh, say yes or no to the draft positions that are being put into the into the package. This year, there are nine positions that VSBA has, and I sent uh, an extract. Uh, thank you, uh, Ms. Goodell, for distributing that to everybody. I sent an uh, extract from the very thick book that comes for that meeting, um, but focuses on the, uh, on the positions that have been put there. 
really what I need to have, not tonight, but by the time I go to this assembly, which is on the 15th of November. So our next meeting on the 9th of no November would be fine to get a final, uh, final view on this, but um, how folks would like me to vote on, uh, on each of these positions. So I think tonight I, I could go through each one of them, but I don't know that that's what, what you'd like to spend the time on, um, Sheila. And I think instead what I could just do is ask if there are any questions that anybody would like to, me to talk about on these tonight. Um, and then I would ask for some more time on the ninth um, to, to finalize things because then I'm set up for the 15th. Sounds good. Are there any questions on this that people have at this point? Uh, Vice Chair Downs. Thank you, Chair Litton. Thank you, Dr. Anderson. Um, I have a question um, for legislative position number one about the limited English proficient students. Um, and maybe this is for Dr. Noonan. Would this be something appropriate to uh, run by Dr. Santiago just to take a look at this? It's never a bad idea uh, for, for staff to take a look. I certainly can ask her to take a look at it. Um, just pulling it up right now. Um, about the fair assessment of limited of LEP students, right? Right. Yeah. Um, sure. Yeah. It just it just it, get, it does get what, into the weeds a little bit. So I just thought maybe she it would be good to just get her if there's anything that she sees in there that's um, problematic or it might be in, you know just get some feedback from her. Is there any objection from other board members or? Okay. Okay. Uh, we'll send it on and see if she has any thoughts. Thank you. All right. Anything else from anyone? Any questions? All right. Not seeing any. Um, I believe we have completed this item. All right. Next, we will move on to 2.03 ARPA funding request to the general government. Thank you, Chair Litton. I'm going to actually turn it right over to uh, Ms. Michael, who's been, and, but before I do, let me just say this. Um, just want to say, um, uh, give a shout out to uh, Wyatt Shields, our city manager, and Karen Bawa, uh, the chief financial officer, who we've been working very closely with on some of these um, requests. So, Ms. Michael. Thank you so much for the opportunity this evening to talk about our request to the general government. Um, we have been including information about our pandemic related funding in our monthly budget monitoring reports. And in order to be more transparent, we're working on putting information on the website that will have our pandemic information separately. So we've put it all together in this package tonight so people can see the full view, not just the piece that we're talking about tonight. And that report um, is very similar to what you guys have been seeing each month. It divides first what we spent in 2021 and then after you get through that section and you get to page three, it starts to look at our second round of pandemic funding, things that are upcoming. Um, so just um, to have that note as we start with. So what we really wanted to focus on tonight were the requests that we're making to the general government in terms of pandemic funding. And I thought it might be helpful first to start with the initial thing that we asked the general government for as part of our initial round of funding that they so generously provided to us. And that was, we had requested that they provide us with $250,000 in support so we could hire an additional counseling position to help students transitioning from middle to high school. Um, so that was funded and that position is in place this current school year. And we had that request for next year as well. So when we look at the things that we asked the general government for, for this next round of pandemic funding, the first thing is to continue that counselor for a longer period of time. And um, we're seeing that need for student mental health and well-being. So the first item that counselor um, of $273,000 is to expand that position and continue it um, for a much longer period of time, all the way through 2026 in this request. The next item that we asked the general government for funding for are two clinical psychologists, um, again, to support our students. And that would start next fiscal year and, and go through 2026. Um, we also asked the general government for support this last item, infrastructure improvements. Um, there is federal grant funding that is to improve HVAC, air quality, and other components, and it requires a 100% match. And they had indicated that we could use other pandemic funding to meet that match requirement. So we did request that they provide us with that match funding to meet that match. And then the last item that we asked for their support on, and I put this last as it heads into the next item, is support for our employees. 
Um, we have been working with the general government, Wyatt Shields and Kieran Bawa. Um, and this is funding to help us support a one-time salary enhancement for our employees. Um, so we had asked for 254,000 towards that effort. Can I, can I just add something to this? Because we've never had clinical psychologists on staff that um, we, ha we have psychologists on staff that are working with students in a one-on-one -on -one, um, way, but this is more, this is more of a, a opportunity for our kids to get um, immediate and in-time therapy services. So essentially we would be, we would have two clinical therapists on retainer that would be available to us at any point in time if there were a kid in crisis that needed some other mental health that may not be um, appropriate for our psychologists that are on staff. So this is a, a, just one more level of support for our kids, perhaps what we have now. So I just wanted to make sure you, when you saw that, you knew that that was more of a, a clinical um, and, and a long potential longer term um, therapy service for some of our kids. That's it. A question. Um, for two clinical psychologists, uh, we're spending $1.2 million. That's over three years. Four years. Four years, sorry. Four years. Okay. Correct. And that's full yeah. salary and benefits. Anybody for want that job? People. I'll take it. <laughs> <laughs> for the four year No, it's, it's for four years. Mm -hmm. and, and Mr. Henderson also includes benefits. That's why I was, when I first joined the board, it, it always seemed, and I realized it also includes benefits. But a really good question. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, Dr. Noonan, is that something that when, you know, at the end of that, that I, I would assume you would come to the board and let us know if this is something that, you know, we we want to make this permanent and find the money for it at budget time when, when we're at fiscal year 2026 or what have you. Absolutely. It's always hard to get rid of positions that have been in place for several years. Um, and it takes a lot of sort of organizational gumption to do that. Um, but if there are positions that are really making a difference, we would want to try to find right. a way. And, to... and I think we all agree that any position where, that where uh, staff are working with face-to-face -face with students are really important. Thank you. We also did learn today that the general government is going to hold two sessions to gather input on their ARPA spending plan. Um, the first of those is tomorrow evening uh, at 7 p.m. Um, and then the other will be Thursday on um, November 4th at noon. Um, so we just found out about those, but we'll be sharing that information as well. Mr. Reidinger. Uh, I also had a follow-up question uh, in line with Mr. Henderson's. Um, I understand that it's for four years, um, but I thought Dr. Noonan had said for the clinical psychologist that they would be on retainer. It's actually for two full-time FTE who will be at the high school or at the FCCPS um, for that period of time, right? So they're fully loaded um, benefits for full-time staff. Yes, my, my apologies for, I, I think the original vision was to have someone on retainer, but we ended up putting them in as full-time positions. That's correct. My, I guess my, my only question, because I, 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 in line with the comments from me and other board members earlier, earlier fully support efforts to reduce stress. I just am... Has, has has sort of a needs assessment been done so that we think those two clinical staff would be fully utilized? I know Rebecca Sharp was on for a second. She may have jumped off, but um, yes, that we, we have noticed an uptake or an uptick in student behaviors, um, student mental health issues, both at the elementary and at the secondary level. And we would likely split those two people that way, one at the elementary, one at the secondary. So we, we believe that, that those two psychologists would be busy. All right, any other questions? No, I think I'm good.
next on our agenda is 2.04 employee salary enhancements. Yes, thank you, uh, my, uh, Madam Chair. We, we um, would like to, in some ways, repeat what we did in the spring of last or winter of last year, uh, where we provided all of our staff a one time um, salary increment, but we'd like to do it a little bit differently this year. Um, in so far as, um, as, as everyone knows, last year, um, or two years ago, our, our staff did not receive any salary cost of living adjustment or any kind of step. Um, and so the, the total amount of that is, um, of the step would roughly be 3%. And so what we've gone back and done is we've calculated the average um, amount of what 3% would be um, if everyone were to get the average, if you took the average salary and found 3%, it's $2,000. So what we would like to, or what we'd like to suggest and, and offer tonight is that we would do a salary increment in two parts. We would do the first one on December 15th and it would go into the December pay of all of our employees and they'd get $1,000. And then we do the second $1,000 uh, increment in March, on March 15th in their, um, in their pay. The idea behind that would be one, just to sort of spread it out to kind of help um, smooth, smooth that for our employees but also it gives us an opportunity to leverage the $254,000 that you just saw in the ARPA money that we're asking for from the general government. The total cost for this um, as a school division to provide everybody with a $2,000 uh, salary increment is just over a million dollars. Um, as everyone on the board knows, we do have some surplus um, from last year. A lot of that is because of the really incredible work that our teachers and staff have done um, to um, keep, keep going in the face of reduced resources. Uh, and we think it's the right thing to do is to return some of those dollars to the staff that have worked so hard. So, um, so what we'd like to, to do tonight is get your okay, or at least a, a nod to continue working on this because we'd like to bring it to the school board meeting in November for approval so that we can get it in the December pay. Great, thank you, Dr. Noonan. Are there any questions or comments on this? Uh, Mr. Reininger. Thank you, Chair. Uh, Dr. Noonan, I, I mean, certainly, I, I think it's a it's a fair thing to do, especially given the, um, the hold back of the step and the COLA um, during the early days. My only question is, although it's sort of one-time money that we might use from pandemic relief to do this, is the right thing to do to go ahead and give a step to everyone who was denied a step um, because of the fiscal exigency? Um, and should we plan around that for next year's budget? So um, that's my only question. Not, not should we do this, but should we do more? Yes, um, thank you for asking that question. Um, so, so one thing, and, and you know this and the board knows this, but just for the good of the community, um, the dollars that we're talking about and, and asking you to authorize um, at the next school board meeting would be one-time funds. And so anytime you put one-time funds into recurring costs, you end up with a structural deficiency in your budget and we don't wanna do that. So I would, I would suggest that we do both. I would suggest that we look at um, doing this um, one-time slash two-time increment for our staff. Um, and then we are kicking around what um, salary increment could look like at the budget time. And one of the things that we have contemplated internally is providing a double step for those, for those staff members that did miss that step. That will be very expensive. Um, but if we can do it, if the money looks right, um, we would like to at least consider that as part of our planning process. Um, and what that does, we believe, is it really shows value and, and really shows um, our support for those teachers that have stayed with us all the way through. Um, and so we are, we are contemplating that. And if the money is right, I think we, we would like to, to look at that as a possible solution at budget time. Great, thank you, Dr. Noonan. Other questions, comments? Oh, 
Vice Chair Downs. Thank you, Chilla. I guess just for those listening who didn't read this, just to uh, make it clear that the general government is also um, providing um, a one-time salary increment to their staff. So I was happy to see that as well. They are. They're, they're talking about maybe doing it slightly differently than we had originally discussed, but they are looking at doing something for their employees. Thank you. Dr. Anderson, go ahead. Thank you, Chair Litton. Um, so in addition to this, so I, I'm sort of going to channel a little bit of Mr. Reidinger. I, I agree that, that you know, you know one-time funds, this is potentially a really good use of those funds. Um, we did something similar last year in a different way, and, and it was a, a, a sort of vote of confidence um, in folks. My question is, are there other things um, when you, perhaps this is something for the budget process for next year, but if we were to go and ask the staff sort of what what would you guys like to see um what would be the things that they would ask for you know or would do we need i know our teachers are are doing their best we are all facing our school division and others you know um issues getting substitute teachers in you know is there something that we should do that makes it more attractive for folks to be coming in as a substitute teacher is there you know resource allocation for paraprofessionals we're one of the few divisions maybe the only one that I know of that actually gives substitutes for paraprofessionals. Are there other places that the staff would be looking for um, us to make investments? So I'm, I'm wondering about that kind of, you know, what else would, what else would be the right places to go um, to try to try to put the funding, especially if, if in the coming year, there is extra funding still on top of what we've already been discussing uh, in terms of recovery funds. So, um... So to answer your question, that presupposes that we don't go to the staff and ask them what they want. And I want to make sure that everybody is really clear that our principals are meeting with their staffs and asking them, what would you want in the budget process? And they are bringing us um, many of the things that are bubbling up through that process. Um, to, to your question specifically about, and, and I know those were examples, and it's always hard to react to, to examples, but I do want to make sure that um, the community understands that we have begun to do a deeper dive into the substitute issue. In fact, we just sent a survey um, to our substitutes that would ask, asking them what would, what would create a circumstance where you will come in. Because what we found is our substitute pool is utilized on an da average daily amount of about 17%, which means that we have way more substitutes than we actually need. Um, and they just aren't taking the jobs. So the question is, why aren't you taking the job? So we are asking them questions. And some of the things that we're learning right now is that COVID is a fear among many of our substitutes, particularly at the elementary schools. Um, and so that's the other reason why we feel like this bonus, this salary increment would also be a good idea is because we know people are covering for each other and it just sort of sends that message. So I want to we, we actually are gonna put that in the Friday update about some of the information regarding substitutes because there seems to be some lore out there that we don't have enough and we actually do have enough. And then paraprofessional substitutes, we are the only school division in, North, in the entire Northern region that provides substitute paraprofessionals. Um, and you know we're sending the survey to them as well, asking them why they're not taking the jobs. Um, but you know we certainly could look at other salary incentives for them, but if people are afraid to come because of COVID or, or they don't want to work in special education or they don't want to work in something else, those are things we're hoping to find from the survey that just went out. But we are surveying the staff through our principals, asking them what are the needs of the schools that they can also talk about um, when we do our budget process with our principals. Thank you, Dr. Newton, and, and I, I really do apologize if I implied in any way that, that we don't do that on a routine basis. I was actually thinking specifically on this question, right? I mean, if you came to somebody and said, if you had to make a choice between X and Y, which would you prefer in, in where X and Y are these things that we're talking specifically here? But hopefully the answer is we can do both. And, and that's a question. It's the beauty no of the end versus the tier anymore. So sorry yeah. if that came no, across. No, 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 no problem. My apologies. I just wanted to make sure that everybody knew that we are. No worries at all. All right, any other? Oh, Ms. Downs. I just, I just wanted to, I, I know we all, it's getting late in the evening and I feel like it's always the same. I just wanted to state that I am in wholeheartedly support this. I think our teachers and staff, and I know I speak for the whole board when I say this, that 
um, you know, this is the least we can do to to thank them for all of their work. And um, we're just very grateful and appreciative and understand that what they've been through, especially, you know, missing some of the, the salary raises and the uh, step increases and all that. So um, just to put that out there, I know I'm speaking for everyone, that, but that we do wholeheartedly support this. Thank you. Well said, Ms. Downs. Thank you. All right. Anything else on this? Not seeing anything else. We will move on to 2.05 monthly budget monitoring report. Pass that right over to our budget. So Guru. we are reporting this evening on September, um, which is our third month of the fiscal year, and we're early in the fiscal year. So hopefully this will be um, a, a short report this evening. Um, first, again, I'd like to really thank Michelle Kopic, who put this report together and for all of her ongoing work each and every day. Um, I have the summary chart up on the screen that I'll talk about following this on pages two and three are a comparison with two prior fiscal years. There's a data table on page two and a bar graph on page three. And then starting on page six, we provide the details shown by each object, which is the expenditure revenue category um, um, for everything throughout our operating fund. So when we look at September in the fiscal year, it's truly very early in our fiscal year. We have one month of teacher pay in the September budget report. Um, so at this point in the year, we're not providing any projections for the end of the fiscal year. Um, but when we look at comparing our revenue and expenditures with prior fiscal years, um, I, I'll say and globally, we're tracking relatively consistently with the prior years, and I'll explain that in just a moment. And when we look at other revenue, our other revenue received totals $91,949. Um, of this, $43,000 is coming from tuition charged to families from outside Falls Church. And then we've also received stop arm camera revenue. We've collected to date $25,200. That's about 50% of what we budgeted for this year, right? Obviously this is revenue, but it's not good revenue that we'd like to receive. So we have put information, I'm in morning announcements about not passing buses and we'll continue to do that, but it's kind of good revenue and a, and a poor picture. Um, when we look at fund balance, we'll post that at the end of the year. When we look at state aid, um, state aid, of course, is tracking as expected. We're only in September. They're funding us this year based on our projected average daily membership, our ADM. Um, but we need to remember that our average daily enrollment this year is likely going to be lower than the amount that they had used when they developed their budget forecast. So we're 103 students fewer than we have budgeted. So that's going to impact our state aid. The good news is currently there is that no loss provision included in the budget for this year. The kind of bad news with that provision is if the sales tax comes in higher than the state has projected, which it's currently trending there, and we'll talk about that, that will reduce the no loss funding. So it kind of takes away some of that good news um, in sales tax because that's how that no loss provision was written. And when we look at sales tax revenue, sales tax revenue in September in this monthly monitoring report is from July sales. Um, so sales tax from July was just under $300,000. That was substantially higher than our budget, 26.7% just for that one month. Um, so when we look at the next month, a sales tax, which will come in the next month's report, that picture isn't as rosy. So if we look at averaging July and August together, then we're seeing we're trending right now about 17.4% higher than budgeted. That's still really good, um, but it is something we're going to want to monitor because it is fluctuating. Um, but but this will be important and this revenue will be included in the governor's budget as they're looking at releasing that for December. Um, so sales tax is a bright picture. Um, federal revenue to date is $28,991. Um, that's primarily reimbursements for reimbursable grants. That's funding from titles two and four. Um, the majority of our federal funding comes from special ed and we'll get that much later in the year. Um, we generally do that billing each quarter. Um, on the expenditure side of the chart, when we look at salaries, um, the good news is that they're expending faster than last year, right? So last year we had additional savings in our salaries because we had held positions vacant. Um, so when we look at our salaries, they're trending much more in line with the year before, which is what we would have expected and that's good. And we had budgeted for increased turnover and vacancy. So, so that's the trend that we're hoping to see. Um, we pay teachers over 12 months, which, which I remind everyone. Um, so when we look at next year's July and August, that's going to be charged back to this fiscal year as well. So when we look at salaries um, as a percentage of budget, we have 86.9% available. 
that was compared to 87.9% for last year and, and even lower than the 87.1% that we had in 2020. Um, benefits are expending at a slightly higher rate than last year, which is again, um, right where we would have expected. So that's good. And then when we look at all of our other expenditure accounts, we're currently trending higher than last year. That makes sense with our return to in-person learning and also additional expenditures that we've made for COVID. Um, and we'll continue to monitor those. Our other expenditures don't track nearly as um, similarly month over month as salary and benefits. So we'll continue to monitor those. We also at this point have encumbrances, which are um, orders that we've placed. Many times we put encumbrances in place for bills that we know we have. So utilities, for example, our current encumbrances are 3.1 million, which is higher than they were last year at 2.5 million. Again, to be expected since we're back in school. Um, so at a high level, that's the monthly budget monitoring report for September. Great, thank you as always, Ms. Michael. Any questions on this? All right, seeing none, um, we will move on. All right, we are at the final item on our agenda, which is 2.06 diversity, equity, and inclusion discussion. Um, do you, you want to introduce this or you want me to? <laughs> um, you can, if you want. <laughs> well, I know this is a, an important issue for the board. So um, we, we wanted to bring it forward. I know we don't have probably as much time tonight to discuss all the pieces we'd like to discuss, but we thought we would start with taking a look at some of the policies we have in place and seeing if there are other things that could be added but I will turn it over to you to see if you wanted to add anything. No, I think it's a great setup, but I did want to um, make sure that every everyone knew that, um, you know, we, we did, we had a couple of circumstances in our school division this year and in the past couple of years um, that have required us to um, dig deep about who we are as a school system, what we believe um, and how to support kids um, and, and how to support all students. Um, but particularly those students that have been marginalized. And um, I just wanted to let everybody know publicly that the, the student walkout, student-led walkout that we had last week um, was a good opportunity for um, several of our, our young people of color um, to get out and to talk about some very important um, experiences that they've had, not just this year, but throughout their careers in, um, in public education here in the city of Falls Church. And so when it was raised that perhaps we need to look at a policy that um, is specifically around hate-based speech, um, it, it seems to me that, that one, there are a number of policies that we have in place that may not call that out specifically. So is it appropriate for us to then modify and adapt some of the policies that we have? Or is it more appropriate for us to include a separate policy that specifically talks about hate speech. Um, and so where we landed on that, as, as Chair Litton said, was tonight, um, Tr Trisha Minson is gonna talk about some of the policies that are in place and then has shared in board docs two policies that she found from two other school districts, um, one in Oregon, one in uh, California that speaks specifically to um, hate. Uh, I, I don't think we're going to be able to resolve all of this tonight. I think it's a general opening conversation, um, sort of on the path for you all to make th some decisions about where you want to go uh, with your policies, whether or not you want to leave them the way they are, incorporate some new language into what is existing, or to develop a separate policy um, from, um, from what is there. And I'm going to excuse myself, my eye just popped out. So <laughs> He means his contact, because... For those on smaller screens. Um, good evening. So as Dr. Noonan shared, we do have um, a number of policies that relate um, to what the board has raised. The first is policy AB, the diversity, equity, and inclusion policy that was adopted by the board in April of this year. Um, that policy has been posted on board docs. The other one that I have posted or that um, Ms. Goodell posted for us was policy JFHAGBA. This is our policy that prohibits harassment and retaliation. And upon learning of an allegation of harassment or retaliation against any protected class, 
um, as that is defined in the policy. Um, this is the policy that staff and administrators use to make sure that there's a full investigation, that the rights of all students and staff is honored, but we get to the bottom of it and we do what we can to protect our students and our staff. So in looking at um, hate speech, particularly, we did find two policies, both of which are posted on board docs, where there was an anti-hate speech policy or hate motivated behavior policy that were tied to the anti-harassment and non-discrimination policies. So in looking at our policies and hearing what the board is saying, um, one direction that I would look um, to guidance from the board is, do we want to, or does the board want to add language related to um, prohibiting hate speech to our policy JFHA, our prohibition against harassment and retaliation, and in providing the samples from the Oregon School District and from the San Francisco Unified School District, um, would look for the board to say, is there language in there that we're missing or language in there that calls out what we want to specifically add to our policy JFHA. Um, in reviewing this and hearing what's come up um, at a number of our schools, I don't think that the hate speech that we've heard about, um, sorry, let me back up. And any hate speech that has gone on would fall under our policy. So it would be investigated, it would be reviewed, it would be documented, it would be um, disciplined. But if there's language that the board sees in these other policies or other additional language that the board wants to add, these are your policies and absolutely can be added to. So would look to the board um, to advise how, how you'd like to move forward if there is other language, if there's other research that I can do and help bring to the board, or what is missing from our policies. But I would say that um, our policy JFHA GBA might be the, the place to plug in additional language. Um, and also think it's always good to keep in mind the policy AB, this diversity, equity, and inclusion policy that the board did recently adopt. Great. Thank you for your work on this, Ms. Minson. Um, we really appreciate you finding these policies. Um, I'll go ahead and open it up to the board to see if there are thoughts at this point. Um, Mr. Henderson, go ahead. Yes. Um, this is uh, this policy is 19 pages long. Uh, it's very um, um, comprehensive, takes in almost every possibility. I find it inadequate as far as dealing with racial harassment, though. There's a lot of language in here that deals with sexual harassment, but not in hate speech and racial slurs and other kinds of intimidation that might uh, take place regarding uh, around r r the question of race. And so I find it in, in, inadequate, even though it's 19 pages long. And I think that um, there are places where it could actually be streamlined in certain cases. Uh, so I think we need to go back over this and really do a deep dive in the revising this. Great, thank you, Mr. Henderson. Um, Vice Chair Downs. Thank you. Um, I um, thank you, Mr. Henderson, for that comment. I, I do believe Section F does address, and it may not be comprehensive enough, um, harassment based on race, national origin, disability, or religion. Um, but I definitely think that we we could talk about um, putting in more detail in that if that if the board felt that would be the section to to add more language, um, you know, specifically hate speech or. Um, what have you. So I, I do, you know, it, it could be, you know, and I, this is obviously we're, we won't solve it tonight, but it could be just that section F expanding on that um, to make it um, more comprehensive. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Downs. Uh, Mr. Reitinger. Sure. Um, <clears throat> so I'd like to start, I think, and by the way, thank you, Ms. Minson, um, for pulling these out. I think this is exactly the the investigation and the inquiry we needed to conduct. <clears throat> yeah, I don't want to sort of measure the. First off, I, I generally prefer to have 
an overall policy like the one we've got right now, prohibiting harassment, which covers all the bases and adequately covers everything. Um, I don't know right now whether the the language in Section F, as pointed out by um, the vice chair, it, it is adequate or not. I guess I'd like to see some specimen language. And I'd sort of start with the notion of, um, is there anything that we think ought to be covered that is not covered um, in the current language? And if there is, then I certainly have no objection to expanding the language so it is fully comprehensive. I just don't want to add words for the sake of adding words if the words there are adequate to the need. Um, I am concerned, though, that um, separate and apart from the actual policy about uh, harassment, uh, whether we know what the need is. Um, and <clears throat> I note that we say in the recently, within the last year, past diversity, equity, and inclusion policy that we're going to regularly conduct school climate surveys. Um, and I wonder if having done those in the past, now is not a time to do that again, specifically with the aim of having a broader and more inclusive, not to use the term in a second sense, understanding of what the climate is in the schools and what actions we ought to take. Um, I, I don't know the answer. I don't remember specifically when the last climate survey was done, um, but it's something that's come up before. And I'd like to make sure that we are, we have a full understanding of what the environment is to make sure we're adequately addressing it. Uh, thank you. Thank you, Mr. Reitinger. Uh, Dr. Dimmick. Thank you. Building on what Mr. Reitinger just said, I, I actually would like to revisit the policy that we wrote earlier last year. I would like to put in reporting requirements for the monitoring. I am no longer comfortable with um, ongoing shall conduct. Um, I, I actually want to force us to do these things and and establish and I, I am sort of well I, I would welcome a discussion with staff about what would be appropriate for how often to do a climate survey um, um, how often to have disaggregated data presented to us um, I think part of the point of our part of having a policy is having something standing here after we all leave and if there are other people sitting across the table from an another group of people, I wanna be sure that we have a policy that makes sure that the next group of school board members and the, the next iteration of staff, however many years that will come, can't ignore the policy when it's written in such a way as, you know, ongoing information, maybe that's once every four years, um, climate survey, unless we specify, maybe it's once every five years. And I, I, I guess I would like us to be clearer. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Demick. Um, any other comments? I'm wondering, oh, go ahead, Dr. Oh. <laughs> I, I was just wondering if it might make sense for a couple members to kind of come up with a couple suggestions, Sue, like you talked about with our equity policy, if there's things we need to add to that and to look at the the harassment policy and see if there's places where language needs to be added um, and bring it back to the board maybe work with Miss Minson I mean would, would you guys be interested in handling it that way um, I'm just putting that out there and I'm open to other suggestions for the best way to proceed with this. Because I know there are a few ideas and I, I think what we want is we're trying to, we wanna do something that's actually worthwhile as we're, we're digging into this, you know, and I think that's the hard thing with this. How do you actually make a difference? Um, so any other thoughts? Go ahead, Dr. Anderson. 
Thanks, Chair Lydon. It's not a direct answer to the question that you just raised, but because partially because I need to sort of process that a bit. But um, I think it's aligned a bit with both what um, Dr. Dimick and Mr. Reininger had to say about what I want to know also is policy is one thing, but how well are we doing at implementing it? Um, how is it actually being adhered to on the ground? Um, what are the issues? And so the climate survey and actually seeing how we're really doing today and how it's perceived that we're doing and you know, sort of what, what is the feeling? How do the students feel about it? How do staff feel about it at our schools? Um, and are there places that could be strengthened independently of any potential, maybe it's not independent, but you know, are there things that could be strengthened? Some of it is independent of policy change and some of it is you know, if we made the policy clearer or sharper, it would actually help. Um, so that's a, I think for me, that's a big question is, um, how are we actually doing in, in implementing this? And so I would support going and trying to collect that information. As far as it, um, making language changes, I'm torn because part of me wants, part of me wants to know where the gaps actually are and how we're doing now before deciding how to plug those gaps and how to strengthen things. And part of me doesn't want to just wait to wait. You know what I mean? Part of me wants to, to do something because it, it's clear that action needs to be taken. Um, I just don't want to take the wrong steps. So it could be that the first part is to do what you suggested and have some draft language be put together of perhaps a revised section F um taking into account these other examples that have been found but i think until we know how things actually are on the ground i'm not sure that we'd be in a, a in a place to take the right language down, down to that stage so, oh, go ahead dr Dimmick. i just also wanted to for some of these things they're time consuming and potentially costly, um, but staff time and just the work of doing it. And, and it may also involve a bu budget discussion um, if we're going to you know, have things done regularly and they're going to be regular sort of routine costs that we need to cover. Very true. Um, Mr. Henderson. Yeah. Um, I apologize. I. Uh... Apparently um, did not see um, section F, and um, I think it uh, it grasped you know the racial uh, harassment quite well. Um, I just don't, but I I would also like and maybe I missed this as well, but um, you know it talks about you know the superintendent and his role in this, but what about the people um, at the site? at the on the ground at the school and their um responsibilities as far as dealing with the harassment I, yeah i mean i can start and, and then you can fill in the blanks but um you know there there are there are very clear, there's very clear guidance for administrators when, when there is an issue of harassment that is of a protected class or is of someone who is a, a minority, et cetera, to the extent that um, as soon as that happens, um, there are a couple of things that have to happen. One is once it's brought to the attention of the administrators, an investigation has to begin immediately. And it also needs to be documented. Then there are interim measures that are put in to keep the students apart who are being investigated. Then there's an investigation that goes on. There's interviews of both students, anyone else who may have been around the circumstance. And then ultimately there's a decision that's rendered. Um, I, so, so there's a, a really clear process that's been outlined for, for that and also for sexual harassment as well as part of Title IX. Um, but I, I guess one of the questions that I would raise for the board is um, if, and it, it, kind of, it kind of gets a little bit to what I think Mr. Reitinger was saying, is, I don't know how to say this in a way that makes sense, um, but I'm just gonna try. Is what you want a policy that requires 
enhanced discipline, for example, of students who use racialized language? Or is it, do you wanna know what we're doing when a student uses racialized language? And what I mean by that is that it, that one I just described briefly sort of the investigatory process, but we also have a restorative justice process. We also have school counseling processes. We also have, we also have a black student union who was educating folks. We now have the, the so SOCA, which is the Students of Color Association that are also educating students about um, the work. We're also engaged in uh, a literature that speaks to a variety of communities coming together. I, so I guess one of the things as a, as a school person that I would wanna know is what is it that you're trying to achieve by enhancing a policy to include hate speech and racialized language? Because if it's a matter of, we wanna ramp up the discipline, we want it to be tenfold what it is now, that's, that's something that we can operationally do through sort of a regulation that that doesn't necessarily change the policy, um, or is it? Do you want to? Do you really want to know what we're doing um, a, about how we're teaching kids about in, inclusionary culture, teaching about cultural competence, how we're training our teachers, how we're training our students? Because we're doing all of that, and and so I guess what I it's a long winded way of saying what is it that you're trying to achieve by changing the policy. I'll let the chair. I think that's a, a reasonable question. Um, Mr. Henderson, did you want to respond? Go ahead. I don't know that what I am looking for is an enhanced disciplinary action, but disciplinary action, period. What is in the administrator's toolbox so that they can deal with this effectively so that it ends so that they can deal with the issue and hopefully stop the behavior. Surely there's some proactive things that can be done, you know, with students, but then there's a reactive um, part of that as well when something does happen. And that, that's basically what I'm asking. And from an operational perspective, the principals have a number of tools in their disciplinary tool belt, if you will, to be able to work with students and with families if there is something like this. I think what we heard in the, the walkout among some of the students was that they didn't feel that the discipline was significant enough for the students that were um, were using the language. Um, and, I, and I can assure you that the students that were using that language were absolutely disciplined. Um, so I think one of the things that we're trying to balance is what's the right disciplinary consequence given the circumstance to make sure that one, it's used as a, a learning opportunity for a student. And, and two, also sends a message that it's not going to be tolerated here, period. And, and if you do this again, the, the consequence continues to get worse. And it's a progressive discipline procedure with students. So, um, so I want to make sure you, you all as a board know that our principals do have tools in their tools, tool belts to discipline students if they engage in this kind of behavior. If you want to plus that up, if it's racially motivated, I mean, that's certainly something that we could do. It's just a matter of, is that, is that where you all want to go? Uh, Ms. Hamid. Um, I would just say in response to what you said, Dr. Noonan, and what I think other people have said is I think um, that the, these policies are really great, and but many students aren't going to look through, you know, 19-page policies. Many adults aren't going to either. And I think um, there, what you were mentioning at the walkout that people and students specifically don't know what's happening is the main source of tension and the feeling that administration and people in power aren't being active in and proactive in combating racial harassment. Um, and so I think 
maybe this can be guidance for the school board as they think about policies or just generally thinking about how to make those processes as clear and transparent to students as possible um, to make sure that they feel like things are actually being addressed. Because I think there was a lot of confusion about what disciplinary actions were being taken. And I understand there's privacy issues. You can't talk about that with the entire student body. Um, but I think, and including the students in the conversation moving forward about what you know, either the board or what administrators and principals and schools can do uh, is extremely important because I think a lot of that frustration is just confusion and lack of clarity. Thank you for that. That's good feedback. Just one piece in response to that. I We did a half day training for every school administrator and school counselor who assists with investigations over the summer on this policy and on what's required of investigations, how to take notes, how to make sure you gather all the information, make sure there's remediate um, inter um, actions in place to make sure there's no retaliation. We also put on safe schools for every single staff member this year, a required mandatory training on policy JFHA so that every staff member had to click through slides and see what this policy is and what's required. So while students might not know about the policy, Every single one of our staff members, if they hear anything, absolutely should be going to their administrators and investigations should be opened. So um, we can double down on that, but it is something that we've really highlighted for our staff this year and we can continue to focus on. Thank you. And also say, I think understanding that process for students and maybe a way similar to that can be reassuring for some of them. I think that's really an interesting idea that we should probably explore a little bit. Um, I know when students go to college, one of the first things they have to do as part of their orientation is they have to take sort of a Title IX training. Um, and I, I'm not sure that that's not a bad idea for some of our students to, even if it's a video that's short that you have to click through to make sure everybody sees and at least hears what the expectation is that maybe isn't directly about Title IX, but it's more about the culture and the community that you're entering as you enter into Henderson or as you enter into Meridian, this is a place of X, Y, and Z um, to do something um, that runs afoul to that, then obviously there's a consequence. So I appreciate the, the feedback, Sami, and I think it's good. Thank you. Um, Mr. Redinger, see you have your hand. Thank you, Chair. Uh, so. Uh, um, let me follow up with a couple of things that have been said, um, Dr. Nin, and I, I certainly don't, and I, I haven't heard any of the board members asking for, you know, enhanced punishment. Um, it, it seems to me that it's, <clears throat> it's awfully hard, for example, to say, you know, racial or, you know, sexual harassment is bad, but racial harassment is worse, right? All of these forms of harassment are terrible and can be can be a varying degrees of, will require varying degrees of punishment depending on the circumstances. And I would be, I'd be loath to try and specify, you know, aggravating factors or anything that would take the responsibility away from the appropriate administrators to determine the right punishment. I do think there are a few things though that, that we ought to, consider most of which I think maybe all of which have already been addressed. Um, one is, as you were just talking with Ms. Amid, um, I, I think some, you know, I wouldn't say transparency, but some additional clarity of expectations and the, what the policy is and how actions will be taken, you know, at the start of each school year is probably appropriate. You know, I've, uh, with my own kids off of college, I've, I've seen the, you know, the anti-harassment and Title IX type training they've got to do. And I, you know, I, I think that would that could not be a bad thing to just say to students, here are the rules, here are the expectations. You break these, there will be significant consequences. Um, because it tells everyone that this is not, you know, it's not 20 years ago, it's not 40 years ago. We're expecting you to behave like you're in an IB school and you're in a caring community. And so I think that makes sense. Um, the second thing is, and I don't know if this is possible or not, but if, you know, as a part of the equity policy, if we could have additional transparency on things like the number of incidents and the type of punishments that are done, um, or even if it's just a, 
<coughs> a presentation on what the responsive toolkit is um, from administrators, that would probably be helpful um, for both the board and the community. Um, and it doesn't need to go into individual real cases, but to sort of talk about what the series of responses would be for a case so that both we and the community, especially including the affected students, can see that these sorts of cases are being dealt with in a serious way. Um, and I, I have no doubt they are, but I think it, it's, it's, it's always more convincing when you can say how they're actually handled. The third thing is, I, I really is, and I know Mr. Anderson said the same sort of thing. I, I, I think the time has come for a new climate survey because I don't necessarily think we need a new policy. As I said before, I think we probably have policies that are adequate. If we wanna change them to make them more comprehensive, that's good. But I'd really like to understand how effective our, and I mean our in the biggest possible sense, the board, the administrators, the students, the community's actions, how effective they're being in addressing this and beginning to track it year over year. <clears throat> so I would, I'd very much like to understand where the shortfalls are, not the shortfalls in policy necessarily, but the shortfalls in effect. Where are the challenges that we need to address? And what does that mean for what we wanna do around policy regulation um, or other action? So thank you very much. Thank you, Mr. Reitinger. Uh, go ahead, Ms. Downs. Well, I can't, there's not much I can add to that, Mr. Riker, that was very comprehensive. Um, you know, I would just throw out there in terms of, and I understand your point, Mr. Riker, about you don't want to get too far, not you, but we don't want to get too far into the weeds in terms of punishments and which, but, you know, I, I do think it's interesting that in, um, in the law, often you will hear, and again, I'm not an attorney, but you'll often hear when there's a charge made against someone, the punishment is increased if it's if it's a hate crime. So I mean, I just I just throw that out there. I, I think that's sort of something to think about. But I I do um, agree with Mr. Reidinger about just understanding more about what's being done. I mean, I, we were in this position a couple years ago with an incident at MEH, and so um, you know, and so I, this is something that obviously has. Um, still years later, we're still we're still dealing with this. So I think understand, I think Ms. Hamid had a great point about really educating the students better. Maybe it's part of an orientation process, but also helping sort of us to understand what, what the different levels um, of um, proactive training and teaching and that sort of, just so we have a better understanding um, because, you know, I was hoping a couple of years ago, we wouldn't be back in this place and we are. So um, just, and then of course I know it, it's, um, it's a much bigger picture. Um, you know, our country is going through a lot of um, conflict. And so, so I understand that, but let, let's try to help our students, you know, give them the tools um, to be the best people they can be and the most compassionate, empathetic students they can be. So just uh, helping us understand what, what we're doing in the schools to, to work on this. Thanks. Thank you. And I, and I, I just want to also say, you know, um, <laughs> For what it's worth, I think this, the schools get a lot of pressure to do this work, um, and and the schools can create a culture of care for kids. But when we call parents and say your child used this word, and the parent says back, "Well, don't all kids use that? We we use it, or we've used it in our house." We're at a point where there's only so much we as a as a school community can do. And we will work our best to make sure that it doesn't come into our school because there's no place for it anywhere. But I also I also want to say, you know, sometimes, not sometimes, we always need help from our parents, you know, to to sort of work through this as well. So um, I, I've got some good takeaways here um, of some things that we can talk about um, with our with our folks going forward. So thank you and for, I, and I for the conversation. Understand that, and I hope you. Know, I'm not. Asking you all to solve all the problems of the world. No. I, I complete. It's a partnership, right? And Absolutely. so that's what we we need help from from parents. Too. And I was just as disappointed when it when it came back this year, you know, as you were that it came back. And um, it's just it's it's disgusting. It's intolerable, and and um, there are consequences for it. Thanks. Thank you, um, Mr. Henderson. Yeah, um, I was on a webinar um, this past weekend with uh, 
Temple Rodef Shalom. And there was a student from um, Meridian High School who uh, expressed um, some disappointment on the administration's handling of the of the disciplinary actions against the um, culprit of uh, the person who uh, did the harassment. And uh, it could be, you know, uh, an issue of the, the right hand not knowing what the left hand is doing. Um, but that, um, that uh, should have been dealt with uh, and better communicated to the student body, I believe. But there's also a lot of, um, well, it says that the person could be dealt anything from suspension to expulsion. There's a lot of uh, gray area there. And um, um, I don't know to what degree more specificity needs to be made regarding uh, what the actual um, uh, disciplinary action should be. And maybe that's a matter of regulation rather than policy. I'm not sure. But um, I believe that there's more work to be done. I, I don't disagree that there's more work to be done, Mr. Henderson. And, I, and we want to be right there side by side or standing in front of um, our students who need the support. Um, I there's there's been a couple of things that have been brought up tonight that i you know i just it's it's unfortunate that our students and, and miss hamid being one of them as well were concerned or confused or unclear or didn't feel like there was transparency um about the discipline that happened with the students um but that also is sort of the nature of the beast um and it's unfortunate and but we we can't share with other students what the discipline of another student is. Um, and, and I think you, you, uh, you everybody knows that. Um, so I'm, I'm trying to think about, and, and it'll be a good conversation for myself and our, our principals to talk about, it's more about expectation setting and saying, if this happens, something is going to happen on the backside and being really clear about that. Um, but, you know, I, I it, I'll just say it's 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 hard for us to be able to say you know you can't brand somebody with a scarlet letter, and and send them out. But um, it's just hard to it's hard to know all the time. So anyway, great, thank you, Dr. Ninnan. Um, I mean, I think we need to wrap up this discussion. But I, I the takeaway I'm getting is that we're not going to do anything immediately on policies. Um, we won't completely take that off the table, but we're not doing that right away. And Dr. Noonan, I think you got some notes from a couple of the things that Mr. Reitinger suggested that we might be able to move forward on at some point in the coming months. Oh, Phil, were you raising your hand? I was, and I'm, I'm, I'm now cautious about saying anything since you said we need to wrap the discussion up. Oh, um, it's but, okay. Go ahead. Go ahead. But, we can be but, here all night if you guys want. I just but, thought you were looking at me like, wrap this up, Shannon. <laughs> I, I, I'm going to say something anyway. Um, so first off, um, I, I, I don't think anyone on the board means to convey disappointment with the administration uh, or staff of the schools, Dr. Nin, and, um We are dealing with a problem that is countrywide. And as you say, you take your students as you find them. Um, and we have, I think, all sadly learned that um, racism is not absent in Falls Church City. Um, and so we have a lot of work to do, not as a school system, but as a community. Um, and so thank you to you and your staff and all of the other people who are involved in trying to make this a better place. Um, I have one other suggestion that may or may not make sense. Uh, but since we're starting to go into um, budget season, does it make sense to have a separate breakout diversity, equity, and inclusion part of the budget where we aggregate, you know, maybe there's special funds set aside for a new DE, DEI position or positions. Maybe the, the, 
the training budget is put out there. And it might be sort of a, a you know, a cross cut, an aggregation bucket where all the monies follow into other pieces. But it could be valuable for us to look at where we're spending money on DEI and whether we ought to enhance that and what, you know, if so, what those additional investments ought to be. I, you know, that just occurred to me while people were talking. And so that may be um, a dumb idea, in which case I reserve the right to say I never made it. I, I well, one, I don't think it's a dumb idea. Um, two, thank you for um, recognizing the work that our administrators are doing. I, I think they are doing an extraordinary job in a, a very tough time. Um, one of the things that you haven't seen yet is we have updated our placemat. Um, and when we updated our placemat, we took out closing the gaps and put in equity instead. And so when our principals and operations groups and our instructional folks put in budget requests, one of the requirements is that they have to align it to either equity, they have to align it to that, or IB, um, or no, I'm like a caring community. Um, and, and one of the things we can provide to the board that may be helpful to sort of get at what you're saying is how those have been divided so that you can see specifically what is being requested with respect to equity, um, what's, what's requested with caring community and what's requested um, with IB. If that's, if that's helpful, maybe this first go around, we could try that and just see if that helps explain. But we, we, do, we are with you that we, we do need some budget support there. Um, we've been using some, um, some of our funds um, to get some folks in and working with us already. And uh, it's, it, it's been helpful. So that may be one way to look at it. Great, thank you. Anything else, Mr. Reitinger? All right, anything else from anyone else? All right, well, I just wanna say thank you. I do appreciate that this board cares so much about these issues. I know we all just wanna find a way to do something to make it better. Um, so thank you to all the school staff who are working so hard on that. I know we as community leaders just want to find ways to, to speak into this issue to try and help. So we will keep working on that. I think all of us together. And um, I think you've got a few takeaways and we will we'll go from there. All right. All right. That was the last item on our agenda. So um, thank you all for being here tonight. And with that,